All right. Um, the date is uh, Friday, September 25th, uh, 2020. And I am Hanson Sue. I am here with uh, Stephen Adams and William Adams of Adamation. And uh, so to begin, um, could you tell us uh, when and where you were born and where did you grow up? Age before beauty. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I was born in uh, Watts, Los Angeles, and lived there for two years before we moved to Placentia, California, and uh, lived in Placentia, California uh, for what? About 10 About years. 10 years. 10 years, and then moved to Anaheim, and uh, that's where we were raised as uh, children up through our teen years before we went to college. And I was born in Fullerton, California in 1964. Um, same, Placentia is where our house was. Uh, Placentia is just a tiny dot right at the edge of uh, Anaheim. Hmm, I see. So. Okay. And your, um, what were your parents' backgrounds and education? Well, mom was, originally mom was a, a school teacher. Um, but by the time we came along, I think she was already into uh, either a social worker. Stephen, you, you would know. Yeah. Whether yeah. She was, I think she was a social worker at that time. Yeah, and she was a like, social worker who worked for the welfare department. She worked in the welfare um, for a while before she became an administrator. Hmm. Yeah, and our dad at the time when we were children was a typewriter repairman. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah. But he was in the, he was, his career before that was uh, in the Navy, um, actually during World War II, and actually was on two, two ships that sunk in, that were sunk in the Pacific. <laughs> Yeah, so the Indianapolis, yeah, Indianapolis and something, and something else. else, huh? else huh? Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. So, so we're lucky to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any other siblings? Yes, we have a sister. Uh, she's between us, uh, Marlena. And, uh, you know, she's not a, a tech person. But she, uh, it, it, believe it or not, she has, she has more energy than both of us combined. <laughs> uh, you know, very, uh, very gregarious uh, woman. She lives in uh, Arizona. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Stephen, you mentioned, so you were born, you said you were born in Watts? Yeah, in 1962. Matter of fact, I think I was born during the, uh, shortly around the, the, the Watts, Rot, Watts riot, and I think our, our what my mom, what our mom told it, said at the time was that they didn't want to be around that, um, and they had some <clears throat> people who lived out in like in the in Orange County out in the hinterlands and Placentia, Anaheim, Fullerton area was all orange groves and strawberry fields at the time, and so they had some uh, family friends that lived in the area and she wanted to get they wanted to get out of uh, Los Angeles because of the riots and that's how we ended up in Orange County. Oh wow, okay. Which is so, kind of apropos for where we are today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you know right, people right. trying to escape uh, you know, inequality and and racial strife. Right, uh, right. So my mom just wanted didn't want us to be exposed to that. Right, right. Was I mean was it um did did your family face any resistance moving to Orange County? Like the my my mom from you know because our, our father died when we were really young. Um, so I was in the fifth grade. I forget how old I would have been then, uh, fifth or sixth grade. Um, but our, our father died young. So you know she's single parent raising three, and when she was bringing us up i think she in, in her days encountered of course the the lunch counter sit-ins and and protests that were happening in indianapolis because she grew up in indianapolis and when when we were coming up she brought she took us to orange county mainly because they didn't have that kind of strife at the time um and we, I don't, I, I've never, we never really encountered directly, you know, it's the Orange County is where the John Birch Society was started. But not and, in our neighborhood. <laughs> but, but I think given the fact that we were tokens in Placentia and in Anaheim, we were the safe ones. And so we didn't really encounter that. 
Um, and I think my mom picked well as far as neighborhoods, you know, right, where we right. were. So we, we really didn't encounter a lot of that strife. Well, William's experience may have been different, but me being first through the, uh, through the mill uh, and being a very aggressive myself, I didn't have those kind of encounters. Yeah, I, I would say that, um, well, our neighborhood and the neighborhood around us was mostly working class, blacks and Mexicans, migrant workers who were working the fields, you know, and blacks who were, like my dad, came from some war, typically Vietnam vets or, or whatever they were. And our whole neighborhood was pretty much black and, and Mexican. Um, there was a freeway that was put in when we were young that split our local neighborhood in half. And we ended up on the side of the neighborhood that was more Mexican than black. Um, but, you know, we're not in a position there where people are going to be discriminating against us because we're black. It's like, well, you're also being discriminated against because you're Mexican or <laughs> a, a, a farm worker. So we're all in the same pot. <laughs> right. We all played together. We all, you know, we weren't black or yeah. white or Mexican or anything. We were just kids. Right? right. And no one came into our neighborhood to tell us we were something else. So it's like, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Wait, so that was before you moved to Orange County. No, that was in Orange County. Oh, that was in Orange County. Oh, yeah, that okay. was Pl Placentia. Our Placentia neighborhood was like that. So it was actually kind of a lower income neighborhood in Orange yeah. County. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing like what Orange County is today. Where, yeah. <laughs> you know, like my brother said, we were literally, when we went to school, right across the street from us was the strawberry field. You know, yeah. and our weekly play at the, on the weekends, we'd go running through pomegranate fields, orange fields, you know, all that sort of stuff. So we were kind of at the edge of farmland. Yeah, matter of fact, Orange, uh, Sunkiss, Sunkiss's packing plant for one of their Southern California packing plants was at the end of our, our block. So, you know, it was truly agrarian <clears throat> society in, in Orange County at the time. It, it grew quickly, right? You know, so when we moved to Anaheim, we moved, I think, like two miles down the road in you know, traditional Orange County suburb track homes, and that was the edge of the suburbs, and we were on the edge, you know, so we you know, literally crossed, uh, you know, Orange Thorpe um, Boulevard, which is the main thoroughfare connecting Orange County and Los Angeles, and, uh, you know, that was the suburbs, and so my mom wanted us to be in the suburbs, so we moved uh, two miles down the street to stay in the same school district, but um, away from, you know, the, the changes that were happening. But it, Orange County didn't look anything like it does today. <laughs> I mean, now, what it was back then. But one thing that, that was happening in Orange County at that time, we were surrounded by fields, you know, orange fields, all that sort of stuff. But just down the street was Rockwell International. <laughs> and Bechtel Engineering. And, you know, so aerospace was happening at that time. Mm -hmm. And Los Angeles had the bulk of it in El Segundo and stuff like that. Hughes Aerospace was over in L.A., but we had Rockwell, you know. So all the white engineers from Anaheim were working <laughs> at in aerospace, and it's just, yeah. you know, a mile down the street from us. So the kids we went to school with, the white kids, uh, their parents were doing engineering, mm. right? And all us black kids <laughs> and Mexicans, we were, you know, our parents were uh, farm workers and... Um, like my dad, typewriter repairman, or my mom, administrators. Huh. So that dynamic was going on as well. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I was going to ask about, you know, the, the mix, the, the, the ethnic mix at, at the school. Um, yeah. The school is where it gets dramatically different. Like when we were uh, certainly in elementary school, because we actually had to travel a couple of miles to go to the elementary school. Hmm. Um, I would say from there all the way up through high school, we were always only a few black students. So my graduating class from high school is like 330 students. And there were probably a handful of black kids, me included, right? Mm -hmm. Literally five or six out of 330. Mm -hmm. And wow. that was true for the entire time we were in school. 
Is that you think that's right, Stephen? Yeah, yeah, I think that you know, mine was even fewer. As a matter of fact, my, my mom used to tell the story, which was funny when we were in elementary school that uh, McFadden, when we were in elementary school, when my sister followed uh, into school, the PTA said that we doubled our uh, black enrollment. Oh, God. <laughs> Uh, and and my mom it, was on the PTA board just to make sure that we wouldn't get left behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what Orange County was like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's a school that's just a block from our house. Yeah. It's a little reminiscent of Silicon Valley. I grew up here in Silicon Valley in, in the 90s and... It was a little bit like that too. <laughs> yeah, you still actually had in the early nineties. Well, you still had you know, Prune Yard. They had a re had a name for Prune Yard for a reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were still a few orchards around back right. then. Right. Yeah. Um, what What were your your best and worst subjects at school? Well, you <laughs> can go on that with my brother. Uh, <laughs> um, well. It, interesting enough, you know, it's kind of ironic where I am academically today because William and I, uh, our, our, our paths changed academically, not based upon intelligence, but based upon opportunities, I think, because, you know, I uh, went further in, in my educational pursuit, but had the, the least uh, capabilities to do so. <laughs> um, when, I was in, um, when I was in school, you know, I had and still somewhat dyslexic, so I, I struggled mightily, mightily through school, but was, so, you know, the, the academic subjects weren't um, interesting to me. I was, I excelled in uh, sports. I excelled really well in sports. The one thing that, that I used even to this day was like photography and the creatives. That, that's the stuff that was really interesting to me. So I was really interested in the uh, photography and art and stuff like that. Um, but then I, you know, I followed William actually to, to Berkeley. And, uh, and when I got to Berkeley, um, I was going to flunk out immediately. <laughs> and I, I had an epiphany and, and life changed and I discovered academics late in life. And um, I actually finished Berkeley with a, a sociology degree, so I really understand where you're coming from. And then I went to a private school in Berkeley called the Wright Institute for a PhD in psychology. So, um, so I've been so academia became important to me as I got older, and less so when I was younger because of you know uh, struggles. Mm -hmm. And for me, I was just a standard brainiac. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would I would say that out of all the subjects, and this is true all the way up through um, high school, I was way better at uh, English and writing and composition and all that stuff. Hmm. And I was I was good in math. You know, um, I had uh, at home I did my own stuff like erector sets and chemistry sets and physics sets and you know stuff like that. So I was a tinkerer like mm -hmm. that but academically i actually excelled at english hmm. um more so than than math i mean i was good at math but but i was even better at english <laughs> so it's which a, is why and it, but i think that part of that can be attributed to our mother because she's uh you know she was an english teacher um when she was was a teacher and and one of the things that william is uh you know is you, that William is not saying is that, uh, you know, my, our mom, you know, other than buying a Kirby vacuum cleaner, which is what you did in the, in the, in that time, but she also bought a Britannica encyclopedia set. And uh, William, William, and I read that. He <laughs> read it, not, not just like read one, but read all of them. And <laughs> so, you know, he had a head start on, you know, a lot of his peers and so forth because of, uh, of that early exploration, uh, early, um, Whereas I would be out, you know, doing things that were more physical, you know, sports and so forth, where he, he really excelled academically. Right. Yeah. And I would say something, and maybe this will come up later, but it, when I, my approach to programming um, is based on that as well. You know, hmm. I look at programming as just storytelling. Hmm. And it's just you're converting from one language to another. You're converting from a human domain language to a computer domain language. Well, that's all about communication. 
Hmm. Right? It, it, the fact that the language is very limited on the computer side is beside the point. It's just language conversion at the hmm. end of the day. So. Wow, interesting. <clears throat> um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're already talking about, um, you know, the kinds of uh, fun things that you guys were doing as kids. Um, you know, William, you mentioned you're a tinkerer. Could you get more into that? Tinkerer, yeah. So, you know, I don't. I, do they even have erector sets these days? So, whatever, uh, back then, There's the erector sets. Well, no, this is way better than Legos. So, yeah. erector sets were like these pieces of metal. <laughs> There's strips, you know, various sizes, and nuts and bolts. And you screw them together and build like a crane or a castle or whatever the heck. Um, we had Legos too, but I had erector set because it was more mechanical. Mm. Um, so, that kind of thing. Um, I would do things like uh, I built a, a pinhole camera out of a box, cardboard box. So I had read up on, you know, cameras, photography, whatever. And somehow I read something about pinhole cameras. And so I got a box <laughs> and I put a hole in it. And I got inside and I wow. did the experiments. It's like, oh, yeah, look, the picture's upside down. And, you know, so <laughs> I would do stuff like that. Um, I would do mechanical, mechanical. I would do construction things like in our garage, I constructed us a, a big platform to put our HO scale railroad on. And it had a, a hoist system so that when we weren't using it, we could pull the hoist and it would kind of lift it up, you know. But then I'd do other fun things like um, I took all the wheels off my mom's car. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> And put them back on. Yeah. I think mostly correctly, and I I would I took the hood off. <laughs> I don't know how I did. It. This is all before this is before I'm ten years old, right? So I took the hood off. <laughs> it's like how does a ten year old get the hood off a car? You know, and wow. I did, and I, I got it on probably mostly correct. Um, and I would do just repair stuff like, oh, I re our roof had a leak, and I went up and said, okay, mom, you got to go get me this this kind of you know, liquid tar, and I'm going to go up and repair the roof, and, you know, I would just do stuff. Hmm. So that, that's, the, that's how I tinker, at least at that age. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, I didn't do things. I was just your classic kid of like, okay, there's a radio. I'm going to take it apart, and I'm not going to get it quite back together correctly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and I think a lot of that, that mechanical sort of stuff st probably stems from watching my dad with the mm. typewriters because he mm. had tools in the garage and I saw him doing stuff and it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to tinker too, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. Huh. And Stephen, you started a business as a, as a child? Well, we did, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I started exploiting people young. <laughs> 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 no, you started out with good intentions with the newspaper stuff, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Tres yeah, cincuenta, so, tres cincuenta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, selling newspapers and being a, a, a courier and all that. So, you know, the, 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 the typical things that the, the kid does, you know, and having a newspaper on and so forth. But I think what, we're in, like in the next article we referenced is that when I was a teenager, when we moved to Anaheim, we moved into, you know, we, we moved into a, a housing community that was built from the ground up. So we get to, you know, when we got it, it was just dirt, a dirt patch. And so, you know, my mom wanted a sprinkler system and we weren't going to pay a landscaper to do it. So I learned how to do it. And William and I did that. We poured cement and did all these things around the house. And then there was like 130 some other houses that were in the same same place so i would i created a kit and went door to door and said hey i'll put in the sprinkler system for you but he, I, I was too young to drive so it's like you have to take them to the store to buy all the parts and then i'd come <laughs> back and then i would make i would uh do the computer the uh the systems and then i got good at it and then i would bring my friends and william and uh pay them a pizza or something and then we would we did like i think maybe 12 homes or something in this new development and that's actually when i got the entrepreneurial bug right and uh was that because i saw that i was solving a problem right it's like there was a brand new housing development 
the landscapers were late to, to hit our neighborhood, so I just walked around and said, I'll do that for you instead of you doing it yourself. And it was great. Uh, wow. <laughs> and it, the article also said that you you also used your photography skills to, in, in in this enterprise. Yeah, so I use my, actually, actually to circle back one bit, there, there, when William was talking about his cardboard box and his peephole and so forth, I think that's the day I got interested in photography. Oh. Um, oh. Was because. I didn't know I, at all. He didn't know that. Matter of fact, I just told him this just recently, wasn't just recently yeah, I told you this? Yeah, just a couple weeks ago. ago. Yeah, just a couple weeks ago, is that when I remember it as if it was yesterday, you know, he was in the backyard and he had this box, a big old box, and it had this uh, this paper on the front, and and he didn't tell you that he burned his eye doing this, but no, not it, from that. I burned it from looking at the sun through my tel my self made telescope. <laughs> but he when we moving um, right along. along, but when he looked in there and I saw. You know, you know, basically life on the back, upside down like that. It's like, oh, that's awesome. And then there happened to have been a photography class at school, and I wanted to learn more about that. So that's actually my first sight of it was with William. And then when I was in school, I took up photography and converted a bathroom actually to a little dark room. Um, but when we were when we were when I was doing my little business, I would take pictures of all of the sprinkler jobs that I did. So when I went to house to house. I would show them pictures of the jobs that I did, and then also I showed them the couplings that I use and the rainbird uh, heads that I use, the manifold. So I would have my visual aids going to door to door to show them what I used to show that I was legit. And then the pictures were validation of the actual projects. Hmm. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. Fun times. This was also <laughs> this was also the time where. Um, I got my first computer. I don't know if you're going to ask about that or not. But well, actually, I was going to segue into that. That's perfect. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, so um, my interest in computing actually started before that, when we were... I mean, there's a big transition here in our lives where, as Steven said, we lived in Placentia. And then when I was, I think I was 10, we moved two miles down the street and we were then in this new housing development. Mm -hmm. And I was so... Ten, I remember things as before I was 10 and after I was 10, right? Mm -hmm. So after I was 10, before I was 10, um, we actually used to go to this place called Boys Club, like Boys and Girls Club that they have today. And we went to the Boys Club and, and we hung out and we met this guy named Jackie Robinson. Um, mm -hmm. And this was, I think, he taught us both how to play tennis initially and he taught us, he, was, he just became a role model for us as, mm -hmm. you know, young guys who didn't have a black father and you know here he was jackie robinson i think his wife name was veronica was that right yeah yeah, yeah. God yeah veronica and, yeah you know he went to uc irvine and all this sort of stuff <clears throat> actually i don't know if that was true someone else he went to fullerton right. but but he had some computer printouts you know and it's like oh wow what's this and then we moved and my uncle my mom's brother uh, he did work for the navy and he had this computer, the Commodore PET. And uh, talk about ancient technology. I mean, this is one of the first personal computers before the Apple ones came out even. And uh, for whatever reason, he was like, oh, I'm getting a new one. Do you want this one? We didn't uh, forget why, why, why you got it. Because you remember you, were held, you had surgery. Oh, yeah. Well, so I had this, um, I, I'm, I was born totally flat-footed, and you think, ah, what's the big deal? But I was so flat-footed that it caused me knee and back problems. So I actually had this surgery, corrective surgery, on my feet. And while I was laid up, my doctor, my foot, my podiatrist, was kind of a, a computer geeky guy himself, and he gave me this book, which I still have. I actually used this in a, in a video recently. Um, but he gave me this book, and it was like digital computers. And so while I was in the hospital, I was reading this. I was like, yeah, yeah, this is, this is for me, this is for me. And then my uncle, you know, was like, hey, here's this computer. Uh, and so that was the, the entry. And I, I taught myself um, 6502 assembly. You know, wow. this was in the days of like the tape drive, <laughs> you know, tape cassette. There's yeah. no disk drive. It was like tape cassette and... 
you know, you type in your program and if the power goes off, you lost it and all that, all that fun stuff. <laughs> um, so I was learning, well, first it was machine code, which was really hard. And then it was like, oh, you can write an assembly. Um, so that's how I got started, wow. right? And I would do things like hardware interfacing to the machine with a joystick and wow. uh, other fun stuff. Uh, and then the, the Commodore PET turned into a Commodore 64 by the time I was headed off to college. Um, but that's how I got started was this Commodore PET. You know, if you ever see a picture of one, it's just like, wow, that's, that's like classic 60s looking computer. <laughs> Although this, this have is a couple. what? Yeah, so this is in the 70s, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's how I got started in in the computer thing. Yeah. And what, what we am also the the other thing about this uncle or Uncle Jim, one of the things that's uh, important about him and, and our story is that you know he worked with the Navy, but he you know he worked on uh, missile systems. Um, uh, much we don't we don't we know don't a know. lot. Of, <laughs> we don't know a lot about what he did because. No one talked about it. Can't talk about it. But supposedly he worked on the Minuteman system. So to be a, a black engineer, you know, when you see the, um, uh, what was that movie that came out with the, the black women who were uh, the... Hidden figures. Hidden figures. Hidden figures. So he was that, but, uh, but one of the engineers. Mm -hmm. So he was a pioneer himself. And, and I think one, one is, uh, another thing that's important about our story about kind of you know when William talked about our, fa our, our father being to uh, typewriters you know going from the standpoint of race when he was in the when he was in the Navy he was a broiler, a broiler man so you know like all black men at the time they worked below deck and um, that's why he was lucky to, to live after being you know being on two ships that sunk but when he got out of the Navy, he couldn't get a job at, at the hotels. And at the hotels is where most of the boiler men went after they got out of the military. And because of uh, racism and, and segregation, he couldn't work in the boiler rooms. And so he got into typewriters at a, in our school district. And that's, you know, so, you know, he was mechanically inclined. But he didn't jump into that. He was forced into that because he initially wanted to work in the boiler rooms. Because that's what he knew. Right. Huh. Interesting. So you've already mentioned like two sort of male role models. Did you also ha have any other mentors growing up? Yeah. I, well, for me, um, who would I say? There's, there's milestones in my life. There, and it's usually around... Um, teachers and other things. So early, when I was in uh, fifth and sixth grade, I had the same teacher. And this was, I don't know why they did it. It was only for our year that the, the same teacher got to go with us. Mrs. Mrs. Helen Kinsey, you know, uh, she was just a really good teacher. And we had, uh, in my fourth grade, we had, uh, uh, David Ramsey, I think was his name. His wife was blind. And he brought her in and showed us, you know, hey, these are regular people. Here's how you read Braille. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we hadn't, um, as we went older, I had in uh, high school, Dr. Jim Jenkins, who was my math teacher. And I had mm -hmm. him for four years, mm -hmm. uh, same math teacher. He was a guy who was, um, he was a millionaire. And he had worked on the Manhattan Project Whoa. when he was younger. He was a graduate of UC Berkeley. Um, he lived down in Newport Beach. He <laughs> drove all the way up to Placentia, and this is like at least a 45-minute drive. Oh, yeah. In wow. his Rolls Royce, <laughs> every morning, you know, stopped in the office and into the classroom. And he was the head of our sailing club because he had a boat down yeah. in the harbor, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and he was a real role model, not only because, well, I'll tell a couple of things. So not only because he was this figure, like, why are you here? Yeah. And he, he just said to us, it's like, I'm giving back to the system that raised me. Mm -hmm. He went to public schools his whole life. So mm -hmm. he's giving back, right? Uh, his wife was a Stanford grad. So that was always 
fun. She came yeah. from the, the rich side of town and he came meager beginnings. And he's like, I'm paying back. As simple mm -hmm. as that. And he, at one point, I remember in the classroom, um, and in math, I was, I was a really smart kid, but I didn't really apply myself. And he just got me one day, I was the only one in the room, and he said, why do you, um, I, don't, I don't remember exactly, but essentially, why don't you apply yourself to your potential? You know, and it just kind of stuck with me. Because the, I remember one test in particular where he gave us a really hard problems. And I solved this hard problem. Like, it's like, yeah, whatever. It's this Monte Carlo thing, blah. <laughs> I was the only one that got this, this the, the solution. It, yeah. we, were, we were supposed to explain why something couldn't be blah, blah, blah. And I, I got this thing, right? It was a really hard wow. problem. And I was the only one in our class that got that. And he's like, you know... <laughs> <laughs> But I just had other things on my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm not going to be a physicist. I, I, I don't know what I'm going to be, but I'm going to, I'm, I got things on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so these were role models for me. I mean, I, I remember, I can, I'm still telling you the names, right? Dr. Jim Jenkins, yeah. you know, millionaire. <laughs> and, the Manhattan Project. <laughs> and how he lived his life was to give back to the system. And that stuck with me, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that seems, and I went to UC Berkeley, you know, and I still have in me today this, this sense of giving back, hmm. right, uh, to the system that brought me up. So hmm. those would be my, my role models. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, <clears throat> William and I probably we share the same experience with uh, Jackie Robinson. However, um, we, we had, we, we looked at him differently because he taught us how to play tennis. William was interested, didn't play tennis. And it's, to this day, it's my, it's my favorite sport and because of that time. And he gave me a Jack Kramer autograph. The grip was too big for me, but he taught me how to play. And I just thought it was the greatest, greatest thing because no one in our neighborhood played tennis. But th this goes back to something that my, my, my mom, when she, when she moved us out of uh, Los Angeles when I was a, a, a baby, and we moved into Orange County. She always wanted, my mom was, she's funny this way, um, our mom, that she always wanted to be kind of like the first black person in doing something, right? So, you know, the first black person in this part of Orange County, right? When she moved to, uh, later in life, when she moved to Arizona, she was the like first person, black person in the particular neighborhood that she lives in. And now, now, now she's in, unfortunately, she's in a nursing home, but she's the only black person in the nursing home. <laughs> Even with her demented self, she's still a trailblazer. Uh, you know, so she likes to be in those positions where she can uh, shine on her own. And I think that's important because um, she instilled in, in us really young about this, don't worry about other, other people's garbage, you know, just do your thing and, and keep yourself, keep yourself on, on some type of a path. But Jackie Robinson, he taught me how to, how to play tennis and then I hung around because I liked all the physical stuff because I wasn't excelling academically. And then after that, there was a, a, I would go to this tennis store to get my racket strong and I met this guy named Raul Nino and he was, uh, he owned, he was a, a Mexican guy that, that owned a tennis shop in Orange County, which, you know, imagine that. And uh, so he was, he not only taught me how to play competitive tennis, but he also told me how, taught me how to ride bikes. He would come in, he, he became more like a father figure. So he picked us up, picked me up, and we'd go riding bicycles, we'd go to the beach, we played tennis, did all that kind of activity stuff. So, but then when I got to college, um, things shifted. And once I, uh, my early parts of college, I, you know, I, I just struggled might mightily, didn't have a, a direction. But when I got to Berkeley, um, is when, and I started to get interested in business, is when I started to seek out black older men to be like men father figure and mentors. And, my career today is because of, of, of one particular gentleman. Now, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later, but his name was Michael Fields. He has since okay, passed okay. away. But he's actually, he and his um, partner should be in the, the black section of the museum uh, on you know, black entrepreneurs and so forth. He, you know, he was a former 
president of Oracle Corporation. Oh, you know, right. A lot of people don't know that Oracle's first pres U.S. president was a, a black man, hmm. and he was a military man, and, and uh, he took me under his wing, and, and I got serious about life after that. <laughs> wow. yeah. So, you know, moving from, you know, direct mentors to, you know, what's, what's kinds of, um, well, who, are, who are your heroes, like people that you idolize? Uh, for me, it was uh, Nikola Tesla. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure 80% of tech people say the same thing. Um, <laughs> Nikola Tesla was one for me. I mean, I read, I read histories and biographies of people like Tesla and Edison and, and whatnot. Um, but then there was also Crispus Attucks mm -hmm. and Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. you know, and these people... Are we, we growing up? We had these uh, not comic books, but uh, comic books of African American history, mm. and we'd read those, you know, and had these kinds of stories in them, and seeing the struggles of those people and their the bravery of those people um, was inspiring for me, mm -hmm. right? And then people like Tesla is just a different kind of inspiration because it's like, oh, you learn things like. He did a lot of his invention in his head. He was good at visualizing things just in his head. And he was just coming from a different uh, plane. But then there's a silly, like Calvin and Hobbes, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> which makes you just, reminds you that there's different perspectives on the world, right? So some fictional characters, some ancient characters, some not so ancient characters. Uh, and then in modern day, um, I would say that just recently, as over the last six months, I've gained an appreciation. I don't, I don't know if they, level, they rise to a level of mentors or idolizer or whatever, but uh, Malcolm X, mm. um, James Baldwin. Uh, I won't say Martin Luther King because I was aware of him way back then, but I wasn't really aware of really who Mal Malcolm X was, mm. you know. Or James Baldwin is like, yeah, that's a name, but I'd never heard of anything he had ever said until recently. Mm -hmm. So these people give me a, a more modern, um, I won't say inspiration, they give me a modern perspective. That, that, and I don't idolize Malcolm X, but I certainly look at him and go, huh, he wasn't just some violent miscreant. He had some interesting words to say for the people of that time. And there's echoes of it now. Mm -hmm. And there's some inspiration and there's some warnings, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so that's, those would be my external ones, indirect ones. Mm. Yeah, and I think for, for me, it would be um, younger, it would be more uh, like, art, you know, the first one without a doubt would have been um, Arthur Ashe. Um, and I think the reason for Arthur Ashe is because you know, I was you know, exposed to tennis at the time that he was at, at his zenith, but also from the standpoint of you know, doing something that, you know, you know, in the white world, doing something that no one's done before. Mm -hmm. right? And before him was Athea Gibson, who was a, a female um, tennis player and all around awesome athlete. Uh, and even today, I, I kind of, I don't I don't idolize anybody, but I, I do have a very fond appreciation for people who conquer things that are that are against all odds. Like, you know, of course, the Williams sisters, um, one of my favorite, favorite um, um, people right now is like um, Lewis Hamilton and in uh, the F1 driver. Right. You know, he he is single handedly doing to the, the 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 one of the most popular sports in the world that there's no black people and not even in the pits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the the best drive in the world is going to be, you know, as a black man. Right. He, he's doing to motorsports what Tiger Woods did to golf. Um, I, I, you know, I never really looked at Tiger Wood because he's about the same age, you know, not too much. Well, now he's younger than me, but he he came up through. Stanford and that whole thing. So I'm kind of like, yeah, he's from Stanford. But uh, <laughs> I, do have an, I do have an appreciation of what he had accomplished. But the, the theme between all of them, and I think how it relates to William and I, is that all of them were trailblazers in, in a world that wasn't expected to see people like that. And the, the good thing about that is that there's no, there's no script. 
And since there's no script, you get just to do whatever you want. If you look at Lewis Hamilton, it's just like, yeah, I belong here. If you look at the Williams sisters, like their father instilled upon them, yes, you belong here. Same thing with Arthur Ashe and with us, right? You know, we're, you know, black people who have uh, excelled in predominantly white areas, it's because no one told them, you know, they couldn't. They just kind of like, and, and they're also coming at a time where since there's not a lot of them there, the white folks would just kind of let them in because like, ah, you're no threat, you're by yourself. Mm. But it's like, oh shit, then you dominated us. It's like, how'd that happen? You know, because they, ex- they didn't expect <laughs> Who that, right? Who let them in? Who let them in? So, so when it's only one or two of you, they don't, they, you know. No big deal. No big deal. Yeah. No big deal. But if there's 10 of you, it's just like, nah, 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 there's no more french fries. Yeah, we're, we're closed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that VC money's all dried up. Oh, it's all, all dried it's up. Spent. It's spent. Oh, well, we don't have any more. We don't have any more. <laughs> um, what kind of you know books or or media or fiction did you did you consume, read? William, you're the reader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or everything. TV, films. Well, TV, we were classic 70s, 60s, 70s kids. So there were only three stations. So we watched whatever was on ABC, NBC, CBS. <laughs> and we had a regular thing. It's like, oh, Friday, it's Million Dollar Man, you know, followed by Mickey Mouse Club and then TV off, you know. So <laughs> Saturday morning cartoons, Bugs Bunny, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, and then uh, later in life, for me at least, for reading, oh, what did I read back then? I don't remember what I read back then. I'm sure I had a bookshelf, so I, I must have read something um, other than the, the encyclopedias. Um, <laughs> I, I distinctly remember all the way up through college, I read nothing but nonfiction up until a point where I had a roommate who was a science fiction buff. This was Bert, Stephen. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That was the first, my first exposure to science fiction. So he gave me, he gave me Stanislaw Lem or Asimov or something like that. And then from then on, it's like all fiction all the time, <laughs> you know. But I was a strict nonfiction guy for forever. So I would read, um, I read all the religions except Islam. So I read Bhagavad Gita, Whoa. you know, um, the Upanishads. Uh, wow. These are Hindu texts. Uh, I, I have an affinity for India for some reason. The Bible, of course, Old Testament, New Testament. Um, I was into Buddhism. Uh, so I, I read all that stuff when I was in high school. I was into authors like Alan Watts, uh, Carlos Castaneda, you know, all these sorts of things, right? So it was all spiritual, mind expanding. You know, if I could have done LSD, I probably would have, <laughs> you know, but I was too young. So. <laughs> Uh, I don't do drugs. I don't, I don't need it. So that's what I read then. And then I got into nonfiction. I mean, uh, fiction. Uh, and then I got into computer books. And um, there was a bookstore, Computer Literacy, in the Bay Area that's no longer there. Yeah, um, I remember. And that would be a pilgrimage. <laughs> right? It's like I would spend a whole day at that store, <laughs> you know, and come away with three books. But I would spend a whole day at, at a store like that. Um, and now today I, I have, you know, I'm reading some African mythology right now. Um, and maybe we'll get into this, but we even, we made our own magazine. So not just reading, but we also did writing um, as part of animation. Oh, do you have one of those? Oh, well, computer funny you should say that, Mr. Computer Adams. Computer dialogue? I, I have a computer dialogue right here. Oh, that's oh. awesome. It's part of my propaganda pack with a Mac ad on the back. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I even have the Next World magazine here. Oh, cool. Yep. <laughs> for, for me, the, the, the reading wasn't... Uh, I didn't read. <laughs> you know, I was... Uh, you know, I... I, I uh, kind of went past the reading thing and say, well, 
academia is not going to be my thing, so I'll work on the people skills side of stuff. So, you know, I was very gregarious, you know, team captain of this, team captain of that. Big man on you know, campus. Big man on campus. So <laughs> I, was, I was more of, uh, more of you know, the personality and relationships than it was academia because I had, you know, learning dif difficulties. And since I, you know, instead of trying to overcome the learning difficulties, I just compensated for, for them by, you know, I used compensatory strategies for what I was lacking academic, uh, academically. Um, and that's kind of how I chose sociology too, you know, because it was, it was people oriented and, and at Berkeley, you got more credit for class participation and labs than you did for the actual, you know, writing assignments and, and things like that. So I would take types of courses and that would uh, allow me to, to leverage my, my, my core competency and not the th area where I was uh, lacking. But now I'm a reader, and it's it's funny it, it's it's funny how life turns because now I'm a I read a lot, but I like I like geopolitical things, uh, like foreign affairs is something I read like religiously. I like things like that, Economist and things like that, and and, and I, I read them not necessarily because the, I, I'm enthralled by the topics, but I read them because I'm I'm curious about how the the real world, how the world works, and if you want to know how the world works, it's geopolitical and it's business, right? You know, I subscribe to Wall Street Journal, Financial Times. Um, uh, even to this day, I, I listen to, uh, I, I look at uh, NHK, mm. it's a Japanese oh, oh. station, yeah, um, yeah. and I've been watching that station for years now. And I watch it because I wanted to get an Eastern perspective of, of America and of, of, of world uh, geopolitical issues. Those types of things have always been interesting to me and that's, that's the stuff I read now. But younger, it was just compensatory, you know, you know, let me use this personality to get through life. <laughs> Well, let's. Uh, we've mentioned Berkeley a lot uh, as a fellow Cal Bear. Let's let's, let's go Bears. Uh, go, yeah, Bears. go Bears. <laughs> let's 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 move to Berkeley. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, Stephen, you, you you mentioned you know you you were a sociology major. Um, so you were a, a junior college transfer. Yes. Hey, junior, yeah. Go Bears. <laughs> 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 nice. Tough on propaganda. Uh, I do you, are you a true believer? Or are you just there. trying to, you know? Yeah, definitely a true believer. Definitely. Um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Oh, um, so you you transferred uh, from a two year college? Yeah, from Fullerton. Oh, okay. Um, um, so, um, Southern, Southern California. California. Southern California. Yeah. Yeah. So um, once I, I I was I didn't even think I was going to go but uh, William was there and I wanted to be there and little did I know once I got there that he went there to escape me but I followed his, <laughs> I followed his ass but what was really interesting about which about Berkeley for me going back to this uh, issue of not being able to be you know was not strong academically I knew I wasn't going to be able to get into that school um, on the academics uh, and so what, how I got into Berkeley was, I, I forgot how I did it, but I found out who the admissions officer was. And her name, was, and this woman, I, I can truly say, changed my life. Um, her name was Jessica Brown. And I, I went up to see William and I took the train up. He was already at Berkeley before me. And I, and I met with her. And she came in, she, I, I came into her office, she had this big stack. She had two stacks. She had a small stack of, fold, of folders and she had a big stack of folders. And she says, and she pulled my name off the top of the big stack. And, um, and she was opening, she, re, she was reading my, my application. And, and the year before I had applied to UCLA and UC Irvine, and I wanted to be in the UC system because I wanted to run track and field. And so I said, oh, Berkeley has in the Pac-10, I'll, I'll go to Berkeley and maybe they have a film school and I'll take, and I'll take film classes because I thought I wanted to be a film major. So um, I told her why I wanted to go to Berkeley and I told her what my deficiencies were, but I guaranteed to her, I said, if you let me into Berkeley, 
I said, I will not be a statistic of a black person that failed. I will succeed and I will graduate from Berkeley if you give me the opportunity. And I know that I'm not the model student, but I just need an opportunity. And she looked at me, she smiled, and as I was leaving, she, she made me, she, she didn't say it, but she took my folder, she closed it up and she smiled at me and then instead of putting it back on the big stack, she put it on the small stack. Hmm. And then two weeks later, I got an acceptance to Berkeley. Wow. That's <laughs> making me cry, that's so touching. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that whole story. What was What's that? Downtown Jackie Brown, what was her name? No, 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 <laughs> downtown Jackie Brown. No, no, Jessica Brown. Oh, Jessica, oh, Jessica. Brown. That's Jessica pretty, Brown. That's pretty good. I mean, I knew you came for the, the running, but I didn't know that whole, like, big stack, little stack story. Yeah, I, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to prove everybody wrong. Even my mom, you know, she, you know, you know, my mom, and I, she, she and I had it out. You know, every parent has their favorite child, right? And, you know, there's, that's there's no... There's no secret that William was her the favorite, but it took me a, a many years to understand that it was okay, um, because William was a lot like my mom. You know, she, you know, she's my mom. Our, our mom is very heady, uh, very serious, and um, and I felt that well. I'll go, I have to be as smart, so I will, and even though I'm the oldest, right, eldest, uh, so I say, I know, I'll go to the best school in the country, and I'll show everybody and graduate, because my mom, nor neither of their friends, thought I'd get through high school, more or less a junior college, and wow. definitely not Berkeley. Wow. And so, to be able to do all of that, I was kind of on this quest to prove everybody wrong that I was smart. So it was an insecurity thing that kept me driving, and also wanted to play sports. Um, and then, you know, and I did it. <laughs> I was actually more, <laughs> yes, I was as surprised did, as everybody. <laughs> yes, you did, Dr. Adam. <laughs> yeah. So, so William, I guess your, your journey to Berkeley was much more straightforward or I suppose typical, so. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I was, um, well, the funny thing is when I was applying to various schools, um, Rensselaer Polytechnic School. Oh. They kept sending me stuff, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's like, what? I think it's in Indiana or wherever it is. It's in New York State. Oh, is it? Okay, yeah. it's like they kept sending me it's stuff. It's in Troy, for some New York, reason. near Albany. Yeah, well, it's like I had never heard of this place, and they just kept sending me stuff. It's like whatever. And then I was I was headed for Irvine because that's where a few of my friends from high school were headed, and. Um, Talk about, you know, life changing. It's like, man, I could have been in Irvine. I could have, what are they, ants, anteaters or something? I don't know. That's Davis. So, the what? The what? That's Davis. You see Davis. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So you see Irvine, whatever their, their mascot is. I could have been one of those. And then somehow I got something from UC Berkeley. And at that time, I didn't actually know about UC Berkeley. I didn't know, I mean, other than my math teacher had gone there. So I didn't really know about their prestige in the world and all this other sort of stuff. I was like, eh. So I, I just applied. And I think the order of my applications was probably like UC Berkeley, Irvine, UCLA, or vice versa. Um, what about Stanford? You came up to Berkeley. So I, to I went up to, no, but I mean in the UC system, those are the three I applied to, right? I think I applied to Stanford I went up to Stanford and Berkeley to visit both of them. And Stanford is like, okay, this, this felt like our, um, like our high school. It was a, a big campus with trees and grass and mm. building spread. It felt like home, kind of. And then uh, I'm sure they rejected me. And then I went over to UC Berkeley and I was walking around Telegraph Avenue, you know, mm. And I remember this distinct feeling as I was walking out and seeing, you know, the hippies around, all that sort of stuff. And I walked off uh, through Sather Gate towards Telegraph Avenue and, and with my mom. And I remember just having this thought to myself, which is, I'm as smart as these people are. I can be mm. here. Mm. And, I, and I got in. Mm. Um, and I was uh, electrical engineering, computer science. Mm -hmm. That's where I started. And that was at the time when we were just coming off the card punch machines and PDP 10s with flip switches and all that sort of stuff, right? <laughs> um, so I, I got in. Um, 
for me, college was different though. Stephen had something to prove. I was probably, I had nothing to prove. And I was there just to become um, self-aware. Hmm. You know, I wrote a lot of poetry walking around at night. You know, I still have a folder of a uh, notebook that has some of that early poetry. Um, and I was just discovering stuff. Again, there's like people taking drugs. Why are you doing that? What are you learning? You know, and you're meeting different people. Uh, I fell in love with someone and I was an extreme introvert, man. Mm. I mean, I was the kind of introvert is like, I could not even answer the phone at home. <laughs> I would <laughs> run from it. There's the phone ringing, William, get the phone. I was like, no. <laughs> Steven can tell you that. That is so true. <laughs> like, I'm not getting the phone. Let the dog answer the phone. <laughs> so yeah, he'd rather for... see the dog chew up the phone than answer it. Yeah, it's like I don't want to talk to anyone. I couldn't tell people my name. I, I would spell my name out. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it. You know, I was just too shy. But so Berkeley for me was a coming out thing more than anything else. It wasn't really about learning stuff. Um, it was more about like, oh, okay, well, I'm, uh, this is where I'm going to learn to be an adult, hmm. right? I had nothing to prove, and I didn't really care about um, any of that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was my, uh, my entree to Berkeley. Yeah. Did you, did you explore classes outside of your major? No, I didn't go and sit in on things um, because, I mean... You know, you went to Berkeley, so it's like yeah, you got your hands. Geeks, so. Yeah, so you got your hands full, right? It's yeah. like, eh, you don't really have time. So I didn't get to sit on any classes, but when you're sitting in the dorm with your other friends, you're just learning other things, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, you took a psychology class. Well, what's that about? And you have conversations because you're being all Berkeley like, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't get to sit in on anything. And that's when I, um, I worked at the, the computer store on the campus. Um, I opened the computer store on the campus. Uh, mm. There was this, this guy named Bill Tate that they brought in. <laughs> and this was at the time where um, the Apple Mac was coming out. Mm -hmm. And we were one of the first campuses to carry it. I think we have a singular distinction that on one day, we sold the most um, Macs of anyone in the mm. U.S. for one, wow. some particular, I think it was like a thanksgiving or something like that we had the highest sales of anyone in the u.s um at our little tiny store so <laughs> but that's when b b mug started there too right or app uh, apples oh, yeah. Oh, yeah 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 b mug berkeley mac user group yeah it started it started as an offshoot from from there right at that <laughs> yeah, same so, time so there's uh names like um fred huxham do you know that name have you ever heard that um, I'm not familiar with No, that. okay. So there's some early guys that came, that were working in that computer store, who then later became Apple guys. Um, mm. Fred Huxham was a big deal um, in the community for a while. There's another guy named Jim Takahashi, maybe? Um, anyway, Berkeley was quite a hotbed for um, all things Mac back mm. in the day. And yeah. I was there in the beginning of it. Yeah, wow. That's how, we, that's how we got to Next, basically, is because uh, my interaction with the whole Mac crowd is like, okay, we, we, we wanted to do whatever Steve Jobs was doing next. Right. And uh, he, along came Next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, we're, you know, you, you mentioned you're, you're an EECS major. How many other... Um, black students were were there in the East major when you were there i don't think there were any oh wow yeah i was probably the only one at the time wow but that's i mean it, it seems extraordinary but we are often the only <laughs> yeah take any measure you want and we're usually the only i mean if we get to the microsoft stuff I'm the only blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, this is just our life, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. we're always the only or one of a handful. Right. So it, it's not as extraordinary to us um, because it's just the way the world is. Yeah. But it is kind of extraordinary. It's like, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're the only, 
I was probably the only black kid in my eeks class. Hmm. Um, so, you know, Stephen, you, earlier you mentioned, you know, somebody who influenced you in college. Um, could you talk about that? Oh, yeah, it's, <clears throat> when I was in, when I was in college, it was, it was interesting because there were, you know, the insecurities that I had started to come out, you know, and, you know, in high school, it's different, right? You know, you can personality your way through it. In college, you can't, <laughs> and especially at Berkeley, you definitely can't, right? You see either you, you get through it or not. And, and I had a teacher, actually, before I got to Berkeley, it was in, in, um, at Fullerton. She, I, I took, um, you know, just to, just to give you a, an idea of how bad my reading and writing was then, compared to where I am today is pretty, pretty I chuckle at it. But um, I took uh, English for, as a second language. Oh, whoa. That's how bad it was. And, and I was getting a D in the class. So there were these people who didn't even know English that were doing better than me. And one day I wrote a paper. It was, it was the funniest thing. I said, I wrote a paper called Illiteracy in America. I that's, spelled that's illiteracy paper. wrong. <laughs> that's perfect, man. And the and the paper was it was all like riddled with spelling errors and everything. A and plus. the teacher gave it back to me and thought it was genius. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> She thought it was genius. She goes, I love the way you did this. And she didn't know that I was illiterate. And, uh, and then that same teacher, after she realized, like, oh, yeah, you really are illiterate, she, she came back. She gave me a paper once, and she said, you know, she goes, she goes you actually are a really intelligent person. Your problem is, is you just don't know how to read. You just don't know how to write. She goes, but I think if you learn how to write, your intelligence will come through. And uh, so she taught me how to write, and that set me on the course of, whoa, what's this academic stuff? Maybe, maybe there's actually something here other than sport. So I only went to Fullerton because I wanted to run track and cross country. I only went to Berkeley to run track and cross country. I didn't see these things. But then when a couple of teachers, kind of like Mr. Jenkins for William, said, why don't you apply yourself? That was the kind of the same type of epiphany for me. It's like, once I learned to apply myself, it, it was it. But I think the, the day that it really changed wholeheartedly was when, uh, you know, the Campanile was, I just got a notice from the, from the registrar's office that said, Mr. Adams, you're on probation, another semester and you're out. And the Campanile was ringing. You know how the bells were so Don't exciting. Or who the it, bell it, tolls. <laughs> yeah, it was, at, it was at lunchtime and I was reading this thing and I was like crying. It's like, I'm going to let Jessica Brown down. I, uh, this can't happen. And so I, I buckled up and I took a course with uh, Harry Edwards. Yep. yep. Uh, with uh, sociology, sport, uh, sports sociology class. And then in there, I met this, this guy, his name was Pedro Nuguera, and he was the first black president of UC Berkeley. He was a graduate student, and he's a, prof he's a professor now at um, Harvard. Uh, so he's a Harvard professor uh, in sociology, and he and I became pals. And I was like his campaign manager when he ran, when he ran for um, the president of the ASU. And, um, and I learned a lot about politics. And at the time, uh, when I was at Berkeley, before you guys, it was, uh, it was you know, divestment rallies, you know, because, you know, the people were trying to get UC to divest the monies out of South Africa. And Pedro was on the front lines of that. He was a student, you know, you know, big, you know, big man in the whole UC system. And so I was kind of tagging along with him. And he was a real big influence to understand the importance of, uh, racial justice and, uh, and, and inequality and so forth. So I learned that from him uh, when I was at Berkeley. Right. So was it through, through him that you became active in, in sort of the campus politics and the social yeah. justice causes? Yeah. Yeah, because then I would go to, you know, you know, the, the meetings and, you know, the, the divestment rally meetings and sit with the guys that were the speakers and help them strategize. And so what I found myself doing was being a, a strategist. So I was a strategist for Pedro. I was a strategist for other speakers that were in the divestment rallies themselves. So, um, you know, not 
formula. And that, I wasn't uh, I wasn't one of the forefront guys there, but I was in that environment a lot. So and and in Berkeley, um, the the thing is is you know it's, there's the there's the academic part right where you know since it's a public school it's like either you make it or you don't. They don't give a rat's ass if you make it or not. And then there's this whole at the time still the leftovers from the '60s and '70s of the political side of Berkeley. And I really resonated with that side of, of, of campus life. Yeah. And William, um, did you have any sort of mentors in college as well? No, Influences? not really. No, I mean that was at the time when. Um, Oh, what's his name? He's a famous computer guy that came from Berkeley. Eh, no. So <laughs> my my time at Berkeley, like I said, my time was pretty self-exploratory. So I wasn't I wasn't looking for mentors. I wasn't needing mentors. It was like I was doing my own thing, you know, exploring my own paths. I did a lot of running, bicycle riding. Uh, writing code, managing the computer store, that sort of thing. So there's, there's no mentors there. There were, there were plenty of interesting people um, that were there at that time. A lot of interesting things happening. Like that was the birth of the Pascal language, right? That was the continuing growth of the Unix operating system and the growth of Berkeley sockets and mm. you know we we in the first year they switched from punch cards to terminals connected to a VAX uh, computer. Um, so there's a lot of that was the birth of email, you know. <laughs> so all of these things were happening, mm. and all of those now looking back famous people were hovering around there. But so were the, the scientists from the Manhattan Project. You know, my, pro, my professors in physics were the same guys that had built the bombs hmm. and continued to do research through, you know, either Berkeley Labs or Livermore or whatever. And it was, it was more like, um, it was really interesting. I remember sitting in one lecture where something was going on, maybe it was apartheid uh, stuff or, or nuclear disarmament, who knows what. And we we're all sitting in this classroom and the teacher comes in, one of these famous Nobel laureate professors, and he says, you know, I'm not going to teach today, I'm not going to tell you to boycott the class, let's have a discussion. Mm. And we were just talking about whatever that issue was of the day and eventually I went, oh, actually what I should do is get up and walk out. <laughs> you know. <laughs> So I, I did, you know, yeah. and this was, this was uh, the kinds of thing. Now, I don't idolize that teacher, but those kinds of people, these guys who were driving the, the evolution of our understanding of the physical world were the instructors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't, uh, they weren't mentors. They weren't idols. They were, um, they were perhaps statuettes things that you can look at and say, you're a figure in history, and I hear you saying words. Mm -hmm. Those are very probably influential words. I better be listening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm not a, a you know, golden, mouth, golden spoon in the mouth kid. I'm just a kid from, you know, a meager upbringing. Um, here I am exposed to this, these people, the people mm -hmm. that wrote the physics book that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. Right? So let me just listen. So that's what I got out of, of my time at Berkeley. There was, there was no idols, um, but there was just a lot of things. I learned the, the language TCL was birthed mm -hmm. at that time. <laughs> you know, uh, Bash Shell, I learned VI. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I still have the muscle memory of, of that stupid thing. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it was it was that that was just the birth of me becoming an adult and a lot of stuff that I uh, learned and was exposed to then shaped my later choices in life and even shaped my life today right mm. even without a single person it was just the environment mm. right you know I think one of the things that William was saying that uh, you know in hearing William and then hearing myself talk you know this is this is really exciting we're really glad that you you asked these these questions because. It, it, it makes you harken back to the time of you know your shaping, and one of the things that you know 
you know, it, it's never, you never wish someone to be raised by a single parent. But one of the things that's, I think, meaningful about our, you know, about this whole mentoring thing and seeking it out or not, is that, you know, we're kind of like a tabula rasa when we got into college. So, you know, we didn't, you know, we didn't see how you're supposed to act, or what are the limitations for a black man, and all the, the, the strife that was around, because we weren't exposed to it. Now, our father was exposed to it and had great strife, but he died when we were so young that we didn't get to really, it, it, it wasn't internal, we didn't internal, at least I can say for myself, I didn't internalize his strife and his struggle because he died when I was too young. Yeah, 1972. But so, so, so when, what's that? 1972, yeah. two days before school. Before school, yeah, I remember that. September 7th, 1972. <laughs> so from that, what it, what it does is it, it, it puts you on a path to be able to say, well, you can do anything because you didn't see anybody around you struggle and all the people that you saw coming up, whether it be white or uh, otherwise, they were all successful and this is what you do. It's just like, okay, well, that's what you do if you want to be successful. There's no, you know, saying no. Um, and sometimes when you see no and the no was because you're race, you make it up for some other reason because you didn't have enough uh, racial blockage to keep you from doing something. So you say, oh, that's just a no. Well, I'll just go around that no. Uh, it isn't until you get much older in life that you say, oh, those roadblocks were all racial roadblocks. I didn't see them. I just went around them. Mm -hmm. Whereas traditionally, it's like, oh, that's a racial block. Let me just, that's not for me. We didn't, we weren't exposed like that. So I think that's one of the reasons why we've been able to have the careers that we have had is because those roadblocks, whether they be intentionally racial roadblocks or not, were circumvented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would also say that there's... Um there were probably counter examples at Berkeley, things not to do. Like I remember um, one of the guys in my dorm, his name was Theodore Cedar, and he did in fact get into LSD. And I remember years later seeing him on the street being led by a girl with a collar around his neck and he was clearly <laughs> just out of it. He was like, he burned his brain, you know, he was toast. And he didn't like, want a collar, huh? He, yeah, he was literally he had a collar on his neck. She was leading him around, you know. I was <laughs> did like, did a ball in his mouth too? No, <laughs> no. Maybe he he did when they went back to their place. But you know, it's like <laughs> Theodore Cedar, don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do the drugs. Uh, <laughs> don't don't get arrested. Don't you know? There are several things not to do <laughs> at Berkeley, um, but at the same time, explore, right? Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned your, your father's death, you know, when you were younger. How, was that particularly traumatic for, for, for the two of you? You probably have different, different uh, responses to it. My response, immediate, well, okay. So here, here's how it happened. Um, we were out, my brother and I were out playing. I don't know where our sister was. She must've been at home, right? She was at home. Yeah, so we were out playing. Um, we came home and there was an ambulance there. And I think our dad was either being wheeled out or he was already in the ambulance, but it's like something happened, right? And it's like, what happened? What happened? Um, my first, uh, my first feeling was oh shit i was supposed to mow the side yard dad did it and that's what killed him oh no <laughs> that was my first well i didn't know he was dead he wasn't dead at that point but i felt something happened it was probably my fault because i should have cut the side yard right um and we were we were gathered up my mom went off to the hospital with dad our godparents came and got us and we were sitting at their house um eating macaroni and cheese or whatever we're doing. And the phone call comes in, you know, uh, we didn't have speaker phones. So they didn't, we didn't know what the phone call was, right? What's happening. And they're like, okay. And they didn't tell us immediately what happened. And we're like, well, what happened? And it's like, well, your dad, he's going to have to learn stuff all over again and blah, you know, sidestepping it. And it's like, okay. 
And then we were sent home where our mom was. And all they told us before we got there is like, just don't ask your mom too many questions. <laughs> and then uh, I think our mom made us some macaroni and cheese. And we're sitting there and either my sister asked or, or one of us asked, so what happened? And my mom said, he didn't make it, hmm. you know. And my first response in my head was, can I have some more macaroni and cheese? <laughs> now, mind you, I'm seven years old, hmm. right? Um, our dad and our mom, I mean, they had a very complicated relationship. There was, there was uh, drinking and smoking and loud words and, and stuff. And my bedroom was right next to theirs and I could see this stuff happen you know so at some points I was kind of relieved it's like good well now dad's not going to be mean to mom mm. uh, that was my most immediate response you know I had I had a little boy's understanding of mother and father relationship and it's like well dad's not nice to mom I don't like that so you know I'm a mama's boy right mm. so my first response was can I have some macaroni and cheese no, um, it wasn't your first arrival. You actually said that. Yeah, okay. So I actually said it. You actually said that. <laughs> yeah, can I have some more macaroni and cheese? Um, that, was, that was the full extent of my emotion. Um, we had the funeral. I went up to the cask and I touched my dad's hand. I think I was the only one that did that. And I said goodbye. You know, because I, I kind of understood. It's like, yeah, you had a rough life. You know, thanks for what you were able to do. Um, I kept his hat. I kept his army jacket. You know, I love my dad. You know, it's not like, it's like good riddance, damn bastard. You know, it's like, I really loved my dad. And he was gone. I did not cry until I was 14. Hmm. Uh, I never cried. You know, I didn't cry at the funeral. I didn't cry in private at home. Nothing. Uh, I had a secret fear that his ghost would come out of my closet <laughs> at night sometime. You know, I had a, up until I was 30, I had a belief that I would die early, you know. So until I was 31, you know, I was like, okay, I, I guess, I guess I'm not Jesus. They're not going to take me at 31 like Jesus did, you know. <laughs> None of that's going to happen. But uh, I didn't cry. I didn't deal with it. It was just like, dad's gone. That's it. And you moved on. I moved on. Um my sister had a completely different reaction, uh, and Stephen can tell you what his reaction was. Yeah, well, everything is, is it's funny, because if he, if he asks this question of the three of us, William's story and my story were pretty much in lockstep, because I, I remember everything that he said, and it's all true. But if you ask, my, if you ask our sister this story, oh my God. <laughs> You, you, you will get a Hollywood story. <laughs> you get a Hollywood story and half of it didn't happen. <laughs> but but it would be a good story. Um, I, the, the, the whole thing of what William said is, is, is it's funny to be taken back to that, that day. But it happened. So I, the, the way that he said it. So I don't really add any more color to it. But the one thing that... But our experiences were different because... You know, being the the eldest uh, in the family, there was a different level of expectation for me. So all the black men that came uh, for the serv and, and uh, for the um, the wake, the wake, and for days and weeks after, everyone kept saying the same thing to me. People would give me money and said, "Now you're the man of the house. You got to take care of your brother, your sister, and your mom. You're the man of the house." So everyone kept saying that. So there was this expectation, you know, at, uh, at my, you know. You were only 10. As 10, You're that I was 10. supposed to be this man of the house and I was supposed to take care of my brother and sister. And I didn't want that. I wanted to be a kid, but that was the expectation. I'm not sure. I, don't, I know I didn't do a good job with it, but, you know, that was the expectation. And, and, and it actually, even to this day, um, is, you know, I'm the only one that doesn't have children in our, of my siblings. <laughs> And you did because, fine, by the way. I don't think we were any worse for wear, even though we had our battles. 
Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, you know, is you know the older younger brother battles. You know, we we still had those things, and, and you know, trying to do the whole domination that the big brothers always try to do to the little brothers. So you know, we still had that, but at the same time. I'm also being told, take care of your brother. So, so like at school, we, you know, I was a fighter in school and I, I was a real good fighter, but William never had to fight because like, yeah, I may beat him up, but you're not going to beat him up. <laughs> <laughs> I was protected. So even like though- my brother even, is Don Corleone. <laughs> so even though I would, you know, I would fight with him and mess him up and so forth, you know, you know, and that's what you can see in our relationship today. You know, we, we have a tremendous love for each other. But even as kids, as I was going through this struggle, my job was to what all the men said. It's like, you take care of your brother and your sister. And in our family, I, I do that. So whenever there's been, uh, you know, distance in our family, like every family, I'm always the one that calling the check up to find out how things are, even with our our children inside our family, you know, my nieces and nephews, or nieces, or now I have one nephew. But, um, you know, I make sure that I stay the glue between uh, the nieces and their parent. You know, that's the role, because I was taught that at such a young age. Um, so so it, it was rough. But, you know, but I think it's also added to our, our uh, independence so young to be able to to be, you know, fearless because when you lose a parent and at that age, you know, it can go, it can go extremely bad. <laughs> uh, and I think our sister is on a different trajectory um, because of that than than William and I are. Um, but but there was also some good things that came out of it, right? You know, William and I, our bond is really strong, and I think part of it is because of that time. You know, we we had each, we had each other, and 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 I believe that I, I was responsible for him then. He doesn't need me to be responsible for him now, but even in our conversations today, I'm always checking in to see his about his well-being because that's part of my role, is William's well-being. Hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's Such great. a lone wolf. <laughs> it's lonely on the frontier, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely is. Well, let's uh, let's get to um, your 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 early career now. Um, so the like, foundation of animation. Yeah, and and also right before that. So um, William, you oh. hold on. I'm gonna get one artifact. Okay. <clears throat> um, I guess I'll, Stephen, I'll start with you then. Um, you you actually waited tables. Yeah. For a period. Yeah, for a long period. Because again, it goes back to that whole gregarious uh, personality thing, right? So I wasn't, <clears throat> I wanted to be in the independent. So waiting tables was a way of being independent. Um, and then it was also about, you made money based upon how well you were at serving and what your personality was like. So, you know, I was, I was, I was good at it. And I, and I liked the, I liked the, the flexibility of your own hours. I liked the, uh, meeting new people. I liked hosting and taking care of people, right? So that was also, so that's how I ended up doing it. And I did, I actually, I, at one point I thought I was going to be a professional waiter. Matter of fact, you, given in Berkeley, you'll appreciate this. I remember when I was, um, my first summer at Berkeley that I, and I stayed home and I needed a job for the summer. And I just, I said, I'm a good waiter. What's this, what's this, uh, Shape anise place that everyone keeps talking about. <laughs> I'm gonna go over there and get a job. <laughs> and I and I I walked over to Shape anise and I met Alice Waters. Wow. And I said I want a job. And she looked at me and she, you know she was a, a really striking woman at the time. And uh, and she says, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I want to be a waiter. And so Alice Waters and I were sitting in front of Shape anise and she interviewed me and she goes, you know. She goes, I'd love to hire you as a waiter. She goes, I only have one position open and it is a waiter that's in, he's French and he's in France right now. But if he doesn't come back, I will call you. If he doesn't come back at the end of summer, I will call you and you can wait tables at Chez Panisse. Wow. And then knucklehead came back. 
And because <laughs> I wanted to wait, I wanted to work at Chez Panisse so bad. Uh, you know, I had met, and Alice Waters at that time wasn't who she is today, right? You know, she's a she's an icon, right? She's a food icon for the for the world. But at the time, Chez Panisse was just coming to its own, right? You know, people had parties at Chez Panisse. All these great chefs would go there, and I wanted to be part of that whole Chez Panisse family. Um, and it would have, it would have definitely put me on a different path if I would have gotten that waiting job, and I really hit it off with Alice Waters. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I waited tables, and even when we started animation, I still did it because we Needed weren't making money. any money. So it was a matter of well, I better wait tables to take care of myself. Right, right. So that was always my go back. That's, and so, but it, but it's the theme, right? It's always doing as William said just before he he he. You know, diverted for a moment is that you know it's kind of a lone wolf right you know I've always done things that are singularly being responsible for um, my, my, my myself and actually there's a very important story as a high school story that translates into college of kind of even to this day of why I, I take this lone wolf and uh, the path not taken that when I was in uh, when I was in high school and even before high school, was, you know, sport was my thing. And I was a really, really good baseball player. And I was the only kid in high school that had made the, as a freshman, that made the all-city all-star team. So, you know, was, you know so uh, the, most of the all-star players for our city came from a, a rival school. But at my school, I was the only one on the freshman team that had actually made the all-star team. So I was a really good player. And... This guy came in, this coach, and I was the very first kid that was cut from the team. And I was the flabbergasted. The high school team. But you're a high school team, right? And, and everybody on the team said, you got to be kidding. He's the best player on the team. And he cut me. And, you know, it's probably a racial thing. I didn't know why. But all I knew is I threw my glove on the ground. And I said, fuck baseball. I will never play this, team, this game again. And I will never play a team sport ever again in my life. And to this day, I haven't. And that's when I took up tennis. That's when <laughs> I took up cycling, right? I took up all these individual sports. And then I also looked at corporate the same way. It's like, I won't go to corporate. I will be an entrepreneur. And it's all because of that, because like, I will rise and fall on my merits and my merits alone. Um, and then, but having a, a company, it's like, yeah, I'll be in a company as long as I'm the CEO. <laughs> so I don't mind being on a team as long as I'm the one that's calling the shots. <laughs> so, so anyways, I wanted to share that because I think it's, a, it's instructive about, you know, my core personality of being an entrepreneur. And it started on that experience. I could say that my interest in entrepreneurship started with that ill-fated experience. So that was before you started the sprinkler business. Was yeah, it was all around the same time. I was a freshman. Yeah, yeah. It would that happened all around the same time. Huh, okay. Or the sprinkler business, and then this thing of you know, uh, that actually happened before. Actually, yeah, okay. yeah. Hmm. So, so anyway, and, so that's and, yeah, yeah. So that's my experience. And, you know, William, you, you mentioned that, you know, you, you were working at the campus computer store. Um, you became a manager there? Yeah. So I managed the computer store on the Berkeley campus for, I don't know how long, maybe a year or two. Um, I have this artifact I went in. Okay. Does this look familiar, Mr. Adams? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so... We why don't you tell the story? You'll tell it much better than me. It's a great story. So, well, hold on. Let me see if I can open it. Um, I forget what the combo is. Oh. So we were, uh, in 1984, we decided to start a business. Um, and we were on the UC campus... <laughs> And we were we went into a classroom, um, or one thing to understand is we had an aunt that worked for IBM, and she was a oh. sales uh, she was a salesperson, regional salesperson. So she was pretty feisty. Uh, this is the um, aunt through marriage. So our uncle who gave me the computer, this was his first wife. They had gotten divorced, but we still kept in touch with her. Um, she worked at IBM, and. Oh, 
is. And she gave us advice on how to form a business plan, you know, all this sort of stuff. And then she said, okay, go off and try to figure out your name. Oh, I opened it. Wow. So we did. We went off to a classroom and we went on the, the chalkboard. Chalkboard. Can you imagine chalk? <laughs> so we went on the chalkboard and we wrote up all sorts of names and stuff like this. And we were like automation for this and that. We were going to do teaching, teaching computers. Because one of the first things I did after my freshman year is I actually taught some people over in Walnut Creek how to use VisiCalc. Mm. and word uh let's see word star and basic programming <laughs> on trs 80s or something like that and so we thought oh maybe we'll get into some education you know something like that and then um but we also liked automation so we we're just swirling around and eventually we ended up with um automation mm -hmm. and it was education for application for application right <laughs> I present to you <laughs> Exhibit One. <laughs> this was the uh, our first business card, uh -huh. and it says, you know, automation, um, education for application, and I was the projects coordinator. Wow. <laughs> that was my title. And this briefcase, this was an interesting story in and of itself. So. We originally, we had to go and get a, a bank account, right? And so uh, we, we needed a briefcase because <laughs> they're going to have a business meeting, right? Mm -hmm. So we went and bought a briefcase and then we went and had the meeting and then we returned the briefcase because <laughs> we needed the money more than we needed the briefcase. Uh, this one I think came, came after that, but, but this was, and then we went and had it was like really late at night and something. We went and had dinner at, um, we had breakfast. Uh, I forget a place in Oakland that's not there anymore. Dave's. Um, Dave's, was it? was it? Yeah, Dave's. And we had pancakes. Yeah, pancakes. Yeah. Blueberry pancakes. But the, the bank thing was interesting. And we had done all this after we had finished our articles. Of, it's not articles of incorporation, but our business plan. We finished the business plan. So we we're celebrating. And we went to the bank. And the bank... Um, actually would not give us an account which was really interesting it's like well why not <laughs> and the guy the the banker was telling us all about how businesses fail and that you know we shouldn't do it and blah 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 it's like what does that have to do with anything just open the account <laughs> you know they would not open us an account uh that's that's very strange right and we actually um complained to the Bitter Business Bureau and all that sort of stuff. And I think that branch closed uh, soon after anyway. But they would not give us an account. <laughs> that bank would not give us an account. But this is the briefcase. It still has our um, City of Berkeley original business license, mm. you know. Wow. Uh, and all you see is the address. But this is the actual, like... Um, City of Berkeley, California, business license application, uh, computer consultant. It has my apartment address and our P.O. box and all that sort of stuff. Uh, $40 <laughs> this cost me, right? Uh -huh. So that's, a, that's an interesting artifact. That's awesome. And then uh, I think there's a, I don't know what else is in here. Um, so that was, that was the start of uh, automation. And we were gonna, we didn't know what we were gonna do, but we were gonna, we were gonna have a computer business of some sort, <laughs> you know. And the, and the reason why computers was because it was, it was melding our two interests. Um, William was really interested in computers. And uh, when I, you know, when I, when we were in high school, you know, I was into photography. And, and since I was in track, I got, I, I uh, took pictures of all the track events. Uh, throughout the whole year and at our high school banquet I would I put on a show for everybody for the boys and girls track team and so there was this computer it was a, a computer by Kodak and it was called a QuadraQ and what a QuadraQ did is it allowed you to be able to sync music and multiple projectors at one time so you know the carousel projectors right you put slides in them so I had 
I had, I started, I think my junior year, I had like eight projectors. And then by the time I got to my senior year, I had like 12 projectors and they were all tied together through this quadricue. And I put on a slideshow at our banquet. And that's what actually got me interested in, in film. Yeah, it's like, oh, maybe I'll be a film major after doing this. And so when we started animation, it was like, well, maybe we'll, we'll meld my multimedia experience and interest with your computer interest, and maybe you, we can write programs that can be able to do what a quadricue does, um, whether it be for education or entertainment or whatever. So that's kind of how we came together with our mutual interest that multimedia was, well, it wasn't even called multimedia in the day, it was something else. But today we would call it multimedia and he had the programming and somehow there's some connection there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wait, so I want to step back. So you started animation while you were both still in college, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Early days. So, 1984. Right. 1984. Yeah, 1984. Or, or April. How did, how did, April 1984. So how did you, how did you both decide to, to do this? Because not, not, most people don't start companies while they're still in college. Well, we just did. <laughs> Wait, what was, like, what was the thought process to, like, I want to start a company with my brother? Uh... Well, here, here, keep in mind that this was the days where Apple Computer was um, becoming something, yeah. right? 1984. Yeah. Um, Adobe was becoming something. Uh, and it was a common refrain at that time to think, I'm going to become the next Adobe. Uh. Just like today, everybody, it's different than today, though. Today, everyone's looking for that big cash payout, right? Yeah. I'm going to go to Y Combinator. I'm going to get my founders, you know, payout, and I'm done. We were about changing the planet at that time, right? Because Microsoft was young, mm -hmm. you know. Um, in the Valley, we were all anti-Microsoft or ambivalent. It was like, who's Microsoft? Who cares? Right? We got all these other things we're trying to... And we were uh, also in the... The Valley was more about hardware. So Sun Microsystems was burgeoning. Um, one of my uh, roommates was an earliest uh, employee at NVIDIA. Right? Uh, I knew Jensen Wang. Um, so this was the, the environment. It's like we were all doing stuff like this. So it was the natural to just kind of go, uh, okay, we're going to do this thing, <laughs> mm. right? Um, education be damned. I mean, and it was also a time where computer dudes were making lots of money, just like today. You know, it's like there was no fear that you wouldn't get a job. Mm-hmm. Right. We always would say things like, ah, and if this doesn't work out, I'll just get a regular job. Right. Mm. So it was just natural that you would do something like this. Um, Stephen continued his education, got his Ph.D. and all that. I didn't. I didn't go for the Ph.D. I didn't even finish. Mm. I decided to start animation because mm. I was confident that we would be able to do stuff. Right. I was right. confident in my own technical skills i was i was just cocky i was young i was you know all that so i was like well what do you mean how did you think of doing that how could you not do this oh. <laughs> right it's like how could you not and in particular at that time you know maybe this goes back to the black thing is like uh we didn't we didn't know we didn't understand the limitations that were in ahead of us we didn't understand that no one was going to give us money you know, we didn't understand that people wouldn't buy from us because we were black. <laughs> you know, it's like, whatever. We're, we're just out here like everybody else just going to make it big. We're going to be the next Adobe. <laughs> mm. Right. So that was the yeah, because You felt that because everyone around you felt like that. Right. You know, yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, Adobe isn't Golden where age. they are today. Right. So Adobe was <clears throat> Adobe was struggling just like us. Right. <laughs> right. You know, all the all the the the, the giants of, of the day of today were all came oh. out of Berkeley and Stanford, right? So, you know, 128 Corridor is a different, right? You know, they have their own stories of on the 128 Corridor, but in the Berkeley, Stanford um, environment that you're very much aware of, uh, at that time, 
it's just like you just thought like that you know it's like the like on the 128 corridor at the time there's like people when micro when uh, facebook came up it's like yeah there's a whole lot of companies like that that came out of that harvard cambridge uh Cornell kind of cabal over there. And then in our side with Stanford and Berkeley, you know, this is where, you know, Sun, SGI, um, you know, Tandem Computers, remember them? You know, so, you know, all those things, you know, it's like you knew those people or you knew of those people. I mean, I remember when, uh, when the internet came, I think it was some of the guys from Yahoo, some, I forgot the guy that would come over, it was one of the founders of one of those companies, and said, hey, oh, there's this ethernet thing. We're gonna l link up your, com your, your next computers, right? You know, it's, you know, all that kind of stuff. You just didn't. You just didn't think that. You you just thought that no one knew that the computers would be where they are today. But during that time, it was there was it was an it was an expansion of the user group phenol, uh, uh, mentality, right? It's just like yeah, we're all gonna we're gonna build shit. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get it done. Yeah, you didn't think about inequalities or barriers or any of that stuff. It's just it was something to do because the new frontier, let's go stake our place. Matter of fact, our very first ad in the Next World magazine was this, it was a cowboy galloping across, you know, the prairie. And, um, you know, we, you know, I forget the, the tagline that we had at that one before we got a professional ad comp company. But it was a whole idea like this is a frontier and we're just frontiersmen like anyone else. Right. That was our that was our our philosophy. Right. So it sounds like William, you were the one who had the idea first to start to start a company. No, it was both of us. Or just simultaneously or. No, I mean, we were always talking to each other. So mm -hmm. at some point, you know, on one of our walks, we probably just said, OK, well, let's do a company. I think we can do the following. Right. Mm -hmm. So we both just kind of, um, that was a joint thing. It wasn't like I had an epiphany. I said, hey, Steven, let's go start a company. It was like, no, we were just in it from the beginning. It was, it was just like, you know, maybe one of us sparked it, but I was there when he was building the sprinklers, right? Yeah. It's like, hey, brother, come on, let's go do this now. Okay, let's go, right? <laughs> here's, here's more artifacts. <laughs> oh, cool. This is uh, first Mac stickers. Apple Macintosh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then this is our first bank deposit. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Not from the bank that didn't allow us. This is from First Enterprise Bank. Do you remember that, Stephen? <laughs> yeah. And that, that bank was owned by a black man. <laughs> yeah. First uh, Enterprise, $500. You know, and here's my, here's my first resume. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it's like one page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, getting to the part about, you know, how do we get it started? I think it was a matter of, I, I do remember distinctly this, how can we do something that melds our both of our interests? Because, you know, I've, you know, I then and still to this day lag behind William in the computer field itself. You know, I, computers and the technology industry does not come to me innately. Um, uh, what does come to me is the solution side of things. Um, so I don't, you know, the bits and bytes of computers I can give a rat's ass about. But what I care about is I care about, well, what's it going to do for people? And how do you build a business that people care about? And how do you get sales and all that stuff? That part of the business. So it made it really easy to delineate who was going to do what. Right. You know, I was going to be the, the front guy doing all the business side and building a company. And you're going to build the product. And then we stayed in our domains so we didn't you know there was no conflict of argument because i couldn't code <laughs> and, that, right? and, I don't and like william people. didn't want to talk to people so it was perfect <laughs> and which is changed. ironic <laughs> now because now he's a chatterbox you can't stop him <laughs> you know early so you mentioned you know the um uh, not getting the the loan from that one bank. So um, no, it wasn't but, even a loan. They wouldn't even let us open an account. Whoa, we weren't even really? asking. We weren't even asking for money. For money. Yeah. We just wow. wanted. To, we had our money. We just. So they wouldn't let deposit. us open it. We could even... not even deposit our money in that bank. Wow. In Berkeley. In Berkeley. <laughs> wow. Of all places. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Forget the loan. I mean, no one's going to give us some money. But we could not even. They wouldn't even let us open an account. Wow. 
So, so talk about like you know getting the capital to start. How, how much? How much capital did you actually need, or were, were you actually okay since you were? No, we didn't have any money. So we started by doing stuff. Um, by contract work was originally. So I think how we originally funded stuff was I still had the job at the computer store. Yeah. So I was using my income to fund whatever we were doing, right? Like I remember we had, I had one friend, um, my, the one who went off to NVIDIA later, who created for us a piece of hardware. It was a, a mouse adapter that allows you to use a, a mouse with um, a Mac, a regular mouse with a Macintosh. And we developed that board. I paid him personally. You know, we got the boards made, stuff like that. Um, that's because I was working at the computer store. Mm. At some point, we ended up, um, I guess it was even before Next came along, we were doing some contract work for the guys that owned the building that our office was in. You know, we were doing like um, a mail merge program, printing labels, uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Turbo Pascal, Booyah, you know. Uh, so we were just doing odd job stuff, basically, anything to bring in dollars. So we could employ a couple of people, we could print our magazine, mm -hmm. you know, and, and disseminate. So we had like two or three employees and we were doing enough contract work that we could pay the bills, mm -hmm. right? Oh, um, William's and, being modest. He did all that contract work. I was waiting tables. Okay, fine. I did all the work. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked. Um, yeah, anyway, I did work for RTI, so uh, Relational Technology International, the birthplace of Ingress, the Ingress database. Mm. Um, I was doing a lot of test work for them on, in the early days of relational databases, and that money all just got plowed into automation, basically. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, we were shoestringing it. We never How got investors. Okay. At least not at that stage. Right. So what, was it was it easy to to get those c contracts? Like, were did you eh. face any? I don't. I wouldn't say. That, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. did I not get a contract because we were being discriminated against or something like that? Who knows? Um, well, you also you work for Barbara Lee too. Remember, Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee. Barbara, Barbara Lee. Lee's office. She's congressman, congresswoman, woman Barbara Lee. What did we do with her? You did uh, office. You did some office automation for her. Wow, I'm awesome. Okay. Yeah, and that was before she was a congresswoman. She was just a, a, a city. She was an assembly person at the time. That wasn't Elihu Harris. No, yeah, it was Barbara, Barbara Lee. Lee. All right, so I did that, and I did uh, some work with a, an office, um, a medical hummingbird other office. Hummingbird. Oh, I did Hummingbird. That wasn't medical. That was another one. So there was just various contracts that we would land somehow um, when we needed to, and that yeah. was that. We did good yeah. work. So how did you come to create this magazine, Computer Dialogue? Yeah, it started as A Bit Short was the first name of the magazine, <laughs> and I don't think I have a copy of that. I think I do somewhere, but eh. So we, we started because you know we were education for application so oh, that we, was we, the initial pitch for the for the company was in, you're going to be an educational company yeah but by the time that we were doing the magazine because we had um advertisements so we were selling some stuff right so like here's an ad for an at&t personal computer that we sold right mm. we could sell or, oh, we want to sell uh, diskettes <laughs> or modems or whatever the heck else. Um, so it's a way for you to sell ads in your own magazine, essentially. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It's like, here's, you know, here's a Mac ad, right? Yeah. And we probably had a relationship with uh, Apple to pay us whatever they paid us for that. And we would distribute this on college campuses. Mm. So... Of course, college campus, okay, there's a Mac ad. Well, you know, uh, that's it. So I actually wrote um, uh, fiction. So I actually wrote stories in mm. these magazines. And it's kind of funny because the stories, when you look back at them now, it's like, wait a minute. Now this is what? 
this one's 1986, computer dialogue. And one of the stories in here, um, Derek Glazer was my pen, one of my pen names. <laughs> and I would just write stories about what the future would look like, you know. And in, so just keep in mind, 1986, like I remember uh, one of these stories, it's probably in this one, this is uh, May of 1986, um, was about, so here's an, here's an ad for Prologue, you know, Borland's Prologue compiler. Um, but I wrote a story about, hey, what if you were sitting on the beach and you've got this tablet computer and you, you register for your classes while you're at the beach and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, okay, that's exactly what you would do today with your <laughs> mobile phone, right? But this is 1986, <laughs> right? Or I wrote another story, which is now coming true, about artificial intelligence. And it talks about the, um, the woes or the potential woes of downloading too much information too fast without being able to comprehend anything. And that's exactly what we're going through today, information overload. And it was about, oh, there's this institute that was set up to help people recover from this uh, information overload and blah, 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 blah. So I'd write stuff like that. And then some other stories that were more like technical, like, oh, here's how you set up your R-based database, or uh, here's how you draw lines, or whatever. Um, so the magazine was just a way to sell ads, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and also to put uh, stories out that were just kind of interesting for that day, right? Um, so it was fun. Um, exciting and and that's why i did i think we only did that for what about a, a the first computer the yeah, first magazine year. was a bit short and then uh, we did the computer dialogue for maybe a year or so, so yeah it was a year yeah that was fun man and the stories are just so prescient it's like damn if that negro didn't already know what was going to happen <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah i guess i had it up here <laughs> I actually predicted a lot of stuff that's actually happening. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. So anyway. Yeah, so that so, was the magazine. Yeah, okay. And so um, how did you... How did, how you did this get lead from, to next? <laughs> no, well, I, I wanted to say, like, how did you get from um, doing contract work to, to doing your own, your own products? Uh, the first products were with the next, right, Stephen? I mean, we did the stuff with Avi... But that wasn't really product. The first product we did was on Next. Oh, I, I got a story. This, 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 is, this is the very first product that we, you know, this is one of the things. This, you know how you have life, you have woulda, shoulda, couldas. This is one of those woulda, shoulda, couldas where Big Brother definitely knows, doesn't know shit. Where <laughs> um, CDs. There, there, was this, there was this day that William and his guys, they were... We, it was it was before the it was the Mac and then there was of course there, there was the PC and the PC didn't have the whole window interface mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this was going to be our first product I thought or he, William thought and I talked him out of it so he he he, he says yeah hey, come on over to my apartment I want to show you something I want to show you something and I go over there and he had a Commodore it was a, I, I forget which one it was but must he have had been a Commodore sixty four it was a huh it was a Commodore sixty four yeah it must have been. Yeah, so it was a Commodore 64, and he goes, "Look at this! There's this thing. It was like a, it was a window, basically. And this was before. This was in DOS. It had a window. Not even DOS. I mean, it's just Commodore, whatever. <laughs> yeah. So then he had another window and another window, and it had these multiple windows with these programs running in these windows. It wasn't called Windows at the time. And I looked at it, and I, and I looked at it, and I didn't under, really understand it, and I said. Ah, uh, that looks like a Mac. Who's going to want that? <laughs> no one's going to want that. <laughs> I said, stop doing that. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> That's all right. It wouldn't have gone anywhere. Yeah. And we called it Avi, the Animation Visual Interface. Did we? Yeah. Yep. Avi. And we just named and it. Was, it was actually named after the guy that we were renting space with, a Jewish guy named Avi uh, Stuckenfield. And so, oh, film, yeah. so we were really, he was a, an inspiration to us because he gave us, he saw our potential and gave us free office space to be able to start animation. Mm -hmm. And so we, I said, let's call it Avi for animation visual interface and to give homage to this guy that gave us this space. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. But but I remember the very first product that we we went to a, um, a fair in, in Moscone Center, and I remember seeing this product. It was it was a um, it was a presentation manager. I forget the name of it. It was one of the early, it was like a PowerPoint, but it was the early, it was even before PowerPoint. And I said, that's what I want us to do because it was of course media. And William had this knack for graphics. I said, we should do that thing. So we kept looking at stuff. We said, we should do this, we should do that. Oh, I know what it was called. It was called, it was called Paint. I think it was just called Paint. Um, the, on the Mac? No. Or something else? Was it's probably something else. Yeah, something else. Anyways. But I think we want to get to products because products was like, you make money with, from products, right? You don't make it from labor. You make it from, if you can market it, you can make money off of products. And, you know, and that was kind of the trend going towards products. Because, you know, package software was a thing. So, you know, it's like, well, if you wanted to be serious in the software industry, you had to have a product. You had to have a box. You had to have a box. Yeah. So really, who's calling was the first product, right? Right. And that product was a derivative off of a product that was the the fledgling product called ACT, A-C-T at the time. Oh, and the so Medicare ACT, thing? yeah. So ACT was the you know it was the first CRM product. And so when we first started, what we we did is we got ACT and we got all the other products that were like it. And we just kind of listed all the features that they all had and said, okay, what's the one features that they all had in common? And that was like the feature list. It's like the baseline is they all had to have a contact manager, right? And then some of them had other features, some of them didn't have other features. So that's how we did our first product was we just did, I remember doing clippings and did a feature board and then compared features and to say, okay, here's the five features that they all have. Let's do that. So... Yeah. Um, before we get get too far into that, I, I, I wanted to go back to, you know, talking about the um, the 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 free office space. Um, so you mentioned so this guy, Avi, what was his last name? Stock this is it Stock and Phil? Stock yeah, and Phil. So was he, it free or was it just rent deferred? It was rent deferred. We, yeah, we had we paid rent when we, we could. paid like three hundred dollars or something or a couple yeah, hundred dollars. We, we paid something when we could. Yeah. So the the office itself, uh, you'll you'll get a kick out of this one. So you know uh, you know where West Oakland Bart is, right? Yeah, I think so. Is that's the one near five? It's the one we first come out of the tunnel. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's in the it's in the hood, right? Okay. Yeah. And well, this is not the hood now, but it was a hood then. So it is a shooter mobile. As a matter of fact, it was where her the heroin tract of Oakland was at the corner of 15th and Center, which is our uh, 14th and Center, and we were at 15th and Center. So it was just shoot 'em up bill, and um, they had a they were a beta site for Sony. Um, it was called uh, what was the name of their company, William? Um, uh, yeah, it'll come. Yeah. I have it written down as Catalyst Productions. Catalyst Productions. <laughs> Catalyst God Productions. dang, you really did your homework. Yeah, so Catalyst Productions. So Catalyst Productions, that's where they were at. And they were a beta site for Sony. So they had all this wild Sony audio visual equipment before Sony was who they are today, right? You know, Sony was, you know, it was a, uh, ta uh, Apex and some other people were really dominant at the time. And Sony was this, this small company coming up and they were their first uh, company in the United States to have Sony gear on the audio visual side. And so we were upstairs and they were downstairs and we're trying to, you know, get this business going um, uh, in West Oakland. So I was going to go somewhere with West Oakland. Yeah, it'll come to me. Old. But I mean, that's incredibly generous of them to offer you, like, you know, free or rent deferred office space. Well, the reason why they did it was because there was a Berkeley connection here. So they used to have a they used to have a business. Uh, Callus Production used to it was a fledgling little company. Just him and his partner Joshua Ranchek, I believe his last name was, and they were on uh, University Avenue, and. 
And during the whole apartheid divestment movement, the Catalyst Production, Avi, they, they did some videotaping for free for the students to help because they, they, they were social justice guys. And so they did some free video stuff. And the guys that I was, that we were with, that were, that they were doing this, they were doing this free video stuff, they were complaining because I think Avi wanted like $100 or something like that just to pay for the film. And they, these guys were complaining and I piped up and I said, you guys are crazy. Do you know how much money they're giving you guys in free services? The fact that they want $100 just to pay for the videotape is nothing to ask for. And so when it was all said and done, Avi came over to me. He says, I really appreciate that. He goes, you get it. He goes, um, I really would like to you know, continue a relationship. So, um, you know, I would go in and I'd do some video work because, of course, it was video. So I learned how to use the video cameras and their videotape machines. And then their company, he was a lawyer and he got, they got, they did some video depositions for some big, like, tobacco case or something like that. And so their company was blowing up and they moved to West Oakland. And when they moved to West Oakland, they said, hey, Steve, I know you and your brother are starting a business. Maybe you guys might want to have some office space and we'll give it to you cheap and we needed an office space we said sure so that's how we that's how we ended up in the office space hmm. wow there you go yeah okay um okay so let's let's talk about uh let's talk about next so oh, yeah. clearly, next? clearly <laughs> so clearly you guys were fans of steve jobs already absolutely William was i don't Oh, we both were. You were both we both were. were. Um, For different reasons. William on the technical side, but me because of the showman that he was. Yeah, right. Um, so, you know, talk about, like, you know, why, do you, why you decided to, to do your first product for the next. Well, it might have extended from the Berkeley time. So we were into the Mac. We didn't actually do any product on the Mac. But as, the, as Steve was going off to do the next thing, we just both said, well, whatever he's going to do, that's what we're going to do. Because it's going to be exciting. We missed the boat on the Mac, right? Yeah, um, we didn't see, have anything. We just missed the boat, right? You know, because we were still trying to figure it out. And we didn't have a setting. We were still, you, William and I were working through our relationship, too, at the time. So um, we, we just missed we just missed the Mac, right? Even though we're in the we're in the middle of it, right? <laughs> we're in the smack middle of it at Berkeley, the, the computer center and B Mug and all that stuff. We just missed it. So then, when Steve got kicked out of Apple and he started, we was like, we're not going to miss this one, and yeah. and so it's like, whatever he does, we don't care what it is, we're in, because we missed it. The, we missed the first wave, so we weren't going to miss the second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and somehow either through my connections through the Apple world or otherwise, we got connected to them. And I was doing contract work at Ingress at the time, and we convinced Ingress to allow us to port the Ingress database to the next as our first thing, mm -hmm. right? So imagine, you, imagine going to Oracle today as a developer who's doing some contract work for them and saying, hey, I'd like to port your, your database to, you know, the <coughs> Raspberry Pi, <laughs> <laughs> right? So they said, okay, sounds good. You know, good Berkeley people that they were. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's how we were able to get a substantial thing and on the next side, they're like, hey, having Ingress here would be great, you know. Well, you got to remember, too, that in, the, so the, 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 to add a little bit more color to this is that um, we were trying to look at an angle to get in because the next box cost $16,000 and they were having a very limited de uh, developer program, right? They're only going to let in a handful and they were going to hand select every single one of the first wave of developers. And we got in. But the way that we got in was the way William was saying, but the, the additional color to it and from the business cunning side was that when William convinced Ingress, we had to get Ingress to commit. And then we also had to get 
next to commit and then I had to get an investor to commit all at the same time because we didn't have the money, we didn't have ingress, and but the one thing that was uh, certain is that Next Computers was going to ship with this database called Sybase, right? And they were out of uh, Emeryville. But Sybase wasn't going to ship in time, right? They weren't done. And Ingress, RTI at the time, and Oracle was the distance, right? Remember, it was, it was Sybase, Ingress, and Oracle. But Oracle was, was just like, they weren't there. So, so what we did is we said, well, if we can get Ingress to beat Sybase, to the punch, that will give Ingress an advantage, and then we will look good in, in their eyes. And I think in, in the uh, I, the ad, we actually had an ad, and so uh, an ad in the Ingress uh, uh, publication, I think it's in that materials that I sent you, as mm -hmm. I make a, 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 we're gonna unite Ingress and, and Next. And that was gonna get us to get into the door as one of the first developers, and it worked. Right, and then the, 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 the argument for Ingress was, when we build our data, when we build applications, we'll build it on top of the Ingress database. Right, so right. the who's calling is actually an Ingress app on Next. So we basically, like William with the dial, with computer dialogue, using computer dialogue magazine to be able to sell ads, we're going to do the port and they'll build all of our ads on, and build all of our apps on top of what we ported, which we thought was going to give us a, a strategic advantage. And it did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, you know, I, I think I read that, you know, the, due to that whole deal thing, like, because you, did, you, you didn't have the money to buy the next machine itself to do the development. So you had to have the, both the deals in place on either side to even get the machine to do the well, development. I'll tell you how, how skin of the teeth it was. <laughs> I was actually at the developer days where they show you how to program the thing. And I'm sitting there doing the exercises and I get the tap on the shoulder. Mr. Adams, come with me, please. <laughs> you know, it's like... I don't think your money's been wired in yet. Oh. <laughs> and, and I don't know what happened. Somehow, magically, the money did eventually show up. I was you know? in Texas at the time trying to secure the money through a friend of a friend to try to convince him that, you know, you know this is going to be the greatest thing as a... And, uh, that if you gave us eight thousand, it was eight thousand dollars. Eight thousand dollars that we would make a good, um, we'd make good and return the money in a certain amount of time. Yeah, but I was I was at the place and it was like you may not be going home with your box because <laughs> you had to go there and then you would walk home with your box. And I was out, so he was at the conference and I was trying to secure the money at the same time. Yeah, wow. so I, I was learning about speakers and listeners and. The, writing in objective c and he was off trying to get money so i could go home with the box so <laughs> by the skin of our teeth we got the box wow <laughs> so the first product after that was so ingress was the first thing we did and then after that we decided on all right we're gonna what are we gonna do and we came up with the who's calling mm -hmm. um thing and and then followed on with that with what's happening which is the calendar program mm -hmm. And then, uh, then we did all sorts of custom stuff for Alon Pinnell Realtors. L Livewire was the other third Live product. Livewire. Right. Livewire was pretty cool. If you think of today how we have all of our chat programs, right? Um, Livewire was that, basically, back in 1990. Mm -hmm. um, it was a precursor to that kind of stuff. It had some right. other... Fe yeah, it was just live communications, basically, on a network. Um, ah, that was such... That was fun. So who's so who's uh, what, what what's happening? Um, the the calendar program, it like it. I think in one of the materials that that I that you sent me, it looks like it was broken off from who's calling. Like it, that functionality had been part of who's calling. And yeah, there was there was this company that came out with a product after we came out with who's calling. It was like ACT, right? You had it, contact management. It had scheduling and all this other stuff built in uh, built into it. But there's this other company, was a, uh, the, this guy, he had a product called Pencil Me In, which was a calendaring app. And Stephen Jobs told us that you needed to be able to, your, your application needs to be, your interfaces need to be slicker, and you need, and, and you need to just have it just do one thing. 
So then we said, well, we already had this calendar app. Let's just pull that out and then just make it a separate product. And that's how we came up with uh, what's happening. And, and we did that play on words just for fun, right? You know, yeah, who's yeah, calling? Fine. What's happening? What's happening? Who's calling? Live you know. liar. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how 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 well did the these products do? Well, how we did better. They well, it, it's more of how well the next do, right? So oh, yeah. we were dependent on next. We we did better. Um, we had a couple. We had a couple of sites, you know, not site sales, but we they didn't do that well because you next didn't do. So you had the distributor in Germany. Yeah, but we, we we did better when we rebranded the product with others. Like there was this, there was a company out of Germany called Data Backer, and they were a really big software company. And so we licensed our technology to them, and they did basically repackaged it in Ger in Germany. Then we also did um, a, a repackaging of the product with Hitachi for the Japanese market. Mm -hmm. So then we sold in Japan, um, first through our own products, and then Hitachi then uh, rebranded it. And then we did um, another rebrand. Um, oh, that was Personal Studio. Yeah, um, okay, okay. That yeah, was a different product. Right but but those but but Data Becker did, took us into Germany under a different brand. So we did better that way. And then what we did, like when we get to the Holland Panel and so forth, we use the database, we use the, the tool sets from these commercial products then to do custom products. So now we had this library and now we can use this library for different things. Yeah, and this but, is, but, this was but actually next was easy. never, I think the most successful product that we had and the most successful sale and we, I, I, Correct me, of course, if I'm wrong, but was with Livewire selling it to the CIA. Oh, I think oh. that, I think that was our, our biggest success. I'd rather not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we can because remember they sent us back. You know, they they called us, and you know, of course, the anti-Berkeley uh, that we were, anti-military that we were coming from Berkeley, holding up to tradition. Um, we say, well, I will never do, we'll never do with the military until they came calling. And they uh, asked, you know, is the is the uh, Gulf War was what was it? what was the first one called? Yeah, the Big Gulf, Thunder. Yeah, it's called the Gulf War, I think. Yeah. Was, so the the first world, the first war, and they they called and they said, theoretically, if you had a battle map and you moved the tank on one side, would the person see it on the other side? Yeah, well, it's not built to do that, but theoretically, yes. So they asked a whole bunch of scenario questions. Then there was this guy that came down out of the mountains to visit us and he wanted to ask a whole bunch of little questions. And then we answered all these questions and that was it. And then next thing you know, we got this order for $76,000 for a site license for, for, um, for Livewire. And then it had to be delivered at Moffett Field. Wow. So you had to take the box and we had to go to Moffat Field and deliver it at Moffat Field. So we wow. delivered the, the box at Moffat Field and then, and then it was like a couple weeks later, the, uh, the registration card came back. Because we put a registration card in the thing, right? And they actually sent it back and all it said was CIA and that was it. And we ah. just said, oh shit. <laughs> 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 that was our most significant product sale, though. <laughs> wow. Times. Yeah. Well, you know, because because it's it's been you know well reported that like the you know the security agencies were buying next. And yeah. So that's an interesting. Yeah. Interesting so the, the who's calling that stuff didn't make any sense to them, but the 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 live wire made a lot of sense to them, and we believe that it would it did well and for them. And since it was a site license, we don't know how, where, where it went, how they used it, right. but all we know is they, they paid us a good chunk, you know, $76,000 at the time for a small business yeah. was, was, a, was a lot, you know, we, it was Nirvana. <laughs> yeah. Did, were most of your other sales also site licenses or how, what was the mix between individual sales and site licenses? Well, the, the, next, the next computer, the, you got to remember how expensive the next was. So yeah. it wasn't a consumer, you know, we couldn't sell to consumers, you couldn't sell to businesses because it was just too expensive a machine. Matter of fact, the, the, before they came out with the pizza box, 
the cube itself, it costs, I think this, I think it was like $30 for the, for the CD, for the, for the, the digital drive. media, for the optical drive. Yeah. Probably Just more like one, it was 30 Was it, was it 30? It, it, no, I'm thinking it was more like 300. Wow. Was it 300? <laughs> it was not cheap. And they didn't store very much and they weren't very fast and they weren't very reliable. <laughs> yeah, so we had to, so you had to ship on that. So, but when they finally came out with the pizza box, then we could sell products. But by that time, they, the price was just, it couldn't sell to sell. So that's how we ended up doing the custom work because it was like, okay, let's do the custom work because you can make money there. Because nobody made, the only company that made any money on software that we believe is probably Lighthouse Design. And Andy Stone, Andy Stone did well because he found a good, he found a good graphics niche. And matter of fact, I think Andy Stone did the best as a small developer, but then as a corporate salesperson, it was Lighthouse Design. They did really well too. And maybe Glenn there's a Reed couple did. other guys better, maybe but those Reed two guys stand right out. Brain software, right brain? Yeah, yeah, they came out with publishing stuff. The publishing stuff. But we're not talking about tens of thousands of sales. We're talking about at most hundreds. Hundreds, hundreds yeah. Yeah, no matter which company, because Next just wasn't that prolific, right? Right, right, right. right. I mean, so you, you mentioned all these other third-party developers. Um, you know, were you... How, how much did... Um, you know, was there a sense of community among all these Next developers? You know, did you Absolutely. know all these guys really well? Yep. Like we would go down to Glenn Reed's place down in Palo Alto, his back room that had the light switches that don't turn this off because it costs more energy to turn the ballast back on than leaving it on, you know. And they were, they're all like us, right? They're all like small companies, two, three, five guys, you know. Um, Andy Stone with his castle out and wherever the heck he lived. <laughs> you know, New Mexico. Albuquerque, New, New Mexico. Mexico. He had yeah. this little turret, you know, castle I've seen it. thing. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah, so, you know, we were all like that. We are all just like, hey, are you my competitor? Look, man, we're all just trying to make it here. Hmm. So, you know, we were all, it was a small community, right? We were all pretty supportive of each other. There was not a lot of animosity. Um, Lighthouse Design, I think we were one of the first purchasers of their, they were selling a disc of um, media, you know, icons and stuff like that. We were Jonathan Schwartz, who went on to run Sun, right? Yeah. And, and it's like, yeah, we all knew each other and we were all friendly and we all saw each other and supported each other and lamented together and, you know. <laughs> yeah, we did a lot of lamenting together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we did a lot of lamenting. Yeah. Um, how did you guys get the, the profile in Next World? I mean, like the premier issue. It was Dan, um, was it Dan Lavin? It was, it was, it was Dan Lavin that he thought he- Was it because, because of him? It, well, no, it was because of Janine. Um, oh, okay. uh, Janine, the, the publisher name, her, I remember her first name being Janine. And, you know, being a, a woman publisher in a male, white male dominated publishing scene, she saw the, you know, she, she looked at it as, as I believe, I'm, par I'm, I, I'm just thinking about why she would do it, is that it's like, here's this black company and with this really different computer with Steven Jobs and all that. And it was one of those things that she, I believe that she looked at it as, this is fitting for something that's revolutionary in the computer industry. Let's put a black company on the front. Matter of fact, we were we were two days away from being on the front cover of the magazine. Wow. Stephen wow. Jobs gave her so much gruff about his photo shoot that he was going to withhold authorization for the photo shoot. You know the photo shoot that they did. He didn't like the photo, and Janine told him. He says, "If you don't tell me, if you don't give us a green light by like Friday, and it was like a Wednesday, we're going to put Stephen and William on the cover of your premier magazine." Wow. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so they authorized the photo and then we ended up in the middle of the magazine. But wow. you know, the premier issue, what did they talk about? A black company. Yeah. <laughs> right. The right. right. But we were but you know, and I think I think the outside of the social side of it, we were really further ahead than our peers. Yeah. 
Hmm. Um, because we had done more. The, like Lighthouse Design, they were doing like odds and ends types of stuff. Andy Stone was doing publishing, which was interesting. But they weren't doing things that were really taking advantage of the computer. Right, Andy was, you know, with the graphic stuff, right? That it was built for that. But I think from a business standpoint, we were pushing the envelope further than all of them. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think our story was more unique, right? Andy Stone's story was has been told 20 times, right? There's there's a there's a thousand Andy Stones on the on in the industry, right? There's a lot of renegades like him. There's a lot of corporate types like Jonathan and his crew coming out from the west coast from the east coast. Those stories had been told before, but no one had told a story like ours, right? A black company out of Berkeley starting this thing. No one's heard that story in the industry. So I think that they gravitated towards it because it's like, ah, oh, these guys are legit and no one's told this one before. Hmm. I think that's how we ended up on the first cover. I mean, the first magazine. Hmm. And it helped that we also bought ads too, right? You know, in the yeah. first industry, you know, we bought ads. So we were a legitimate company. We weren't just, just these guys. Yeah. <laughs> just these guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess next week, maybe let's talk about the, the, the realty application with Alain Pinel. Yeah. Yeah, I saw, I, I watched that video that you sent. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah, that was pretty interesting. You got the propaganda. Good. Doesn't that look like? Doesn't it look like it's from the seventies or something? I mean, it <laughs> does have that, and all that. It does have the eighties vibe. And, yeah. I mean, I do. I do remember reading, you know, about the Alan Pinnell like deal for Next Machines in, I think, in one of the Next Worlds. Um, so that you know was a pretty important, I guess, sale. Them, it was you know? very important. As a matter of fact, I don't think people people don't realize how important that sale was. Okay, um, so yeah, so we were going to talk. Um, Stephen, you were going to tell us about um, your Steve Jobs stories. <laughs> and, yeah, and there. there well, Alain Pen I'd like to start with Alain Pinel and remind me if I forget about Ross Perot. But um, okay. <laughs> but uh, the uh, Alain Pinel story is. Um, I think it's it's one of those things that I, I don't think people really realize how significant Alain Pinel was as a customer to Next because it was the the, the first validating commercial uh, uh, customer, and it transformed an industry. And if you look at the industry today of real estate, I think you can trace it back to Alain Pinel because we're we what we did with that area software is where the industry is today <laughs> but anyways it, it all started with this guy his name is mark um mark um richards is it Richards? Yeah, mark richards mark richards he was a uh he was a sales guy uh over at uh, tandem and his was wife it owned FDI? no it was a tandem oh, right. so he um his wife uh, owned, uh, or she was the president of Alain Pinel Realtors, and they had an office in Las Gatos. And the, the chairman of the company was a gentleman by the name of Paul Hume, and he was the backer of it. And she came from Cornish and Carey, and she wanted to start a, a you know, she wanted to revolutionize the uh, real estate market. And so what her vision was, was she was going to take Real she was going to take the top real estate agents from the top firms and create a Lon Pinnell. And the way that she she looked at it is she just she fundamentally looked at that the real estate market differently. And she would talk about all the time how the uh, real estate was that people thought that she was in the real estate business that she was selling houses. And she said, no, I'm not in the real estate business. I'm in the agent business. So my business or her business was to be able to put uh, a product on the desks of the real estate agents so they could be more productive so that they could sell more and that she would pay them less commission because she wouldn't need to pay them. oh no she would get more commission she would pay she would the other way around she would actually get more from them because she would make them more productive so they have more free time so she wanted to put a next computer on every person's desk because if she put a next computer on everyone's desk it would differentiate her business 
from the other uh, from Cornish and Kerry that was in, in that was running the market, and she only wanted to focus at the million dollar home. So her first office in Los Gatos, I think she paid, I think it was eight hundred thousand dollars to outfit the entire office with Next Computers. And Mark Richards, Richardson, when he came to us, he said, I'd like you guys to, he saw Next because he, he was at Tandem. He understood the, the significance of Next and the networking capabilities of the machine. So that's what he was uh, approached, the, why he came to us. So he was the, basically the scout and he drove down from Las Gales and met with us and talked to us about what he wanted to do. And then he introduced us to Helen, and Helen was like Steve Jobs and like all of the small Next developers. All She was a renegade, and she wanted to be able to differentiate her business. So that's how she got into it, and she told us her vision of how real estate should be done. on Next, And then we built the apps, and William designed it, William and his wife at the time. They designed the applications for uh, uh, to transform real estate, and I saw it as an opportunity, as a marketing thing. So I got um, Next to pay for that video uh, as something that we could do together, uh, and so they actually paid for the development of that video that we did. But in that video, it's it, it shows you what the applications in that time was, and the applications that William and uh, built at the time are the types of applications that are just now coming online today. <laughs> well, I can talk a little bit about the the technology that went into Elan Pinel. Um, and it all seems kind of esoteric now. As Stephen says, it's like, well, here we are, what, that was in 1990-something. And um, just keep in mind, we didn't, we didn't really have the internet like we have it today it wasn't as widespread right we were still on dial-up mm -hmm. uh, so we didn't have high-speed internet to your home um, we certainly didn't have html no web browsers no javascript no css uh, none of that um, we didn't have central databases we didn't have cloud storage so we had things like the MLS, Multiple Listing Service, uh, was a dial-up service. You dial up, you type in some query, you get a list of properties, right? That was the MLS. Not like you can go on Redfin or Zillow today, put in some, you know, it, none of that. None of that existed. So one of the first things we had to do was an application for modem sharing because you don't want to have a modem on every single desk, right? That would be like, how, I don't I remember how big the office is, but let's say it was 30 modems. It's like, no, you don't have 30 lines going into a business. Uh, you had like 10 at most. So the first app that we did was a, a modem farm, if you will. Um, there were maybe 10. Not, I don't even think there was 10. There's probably five or six. Anyway, so there's some fixed number of modems that were connected to actual machines. And those 10 or however many they were, were connected to phone lines. And if you were at your desk and your application needed to dial out, it would essentially talk over the local ethernet to a modem that was open. So we kept a little a little tiny database that said, hey, I have an open, an open modem that's not being used. So we would route your, call, your uh, request to a modem, and at that machine that had that modem, it would dial out, and then we would establish a connection between that machine and your machine, and the information goes back and forth, right? So if you're not using your modem, it's being used by somebody else. So we would you know, just kind of go around and say, well, where's an open modem? And if all the modems were being used, then you'd have to wait, but that was that never happened. You know, there's never ten people on there uh, at the same time. So that was the first piece of tech um, that was the basis for uh, their stuff. The second level was okay. I don't want you to have to dial out to the MLS to do your searches every time. What I really want to do is copy the entirety of the MLS to a local database, right? Ingress, of course. Mm. Um, so what we would do was we'd do an initial dump of the MLS, and then all we have to do is keep it up to date, right? You could query and get the changes since the last time you got your query, 
and then just apply those changes. Say, okay, that's great. So now when most of your MLS queries can just hit the local database. And in the background, we would have an automated process that would just dial up the MLS, get the latest downloads, I mean the latest changes, and apply them to the local database. All right. So this is having a um, not quite distributed database yet, but at least a local cache, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the third thing was, okay, this, is, this came in when Alain Pinot started opening up multiple offices. They started in Los Gatos, then they opened another one, and another one, you know, two or, I think we had three offices at one point. And the challenge was when they make changes, uh, a new property comes in to the office, right? They will enter it locally first, and it takes a while to get through the MLS system. It might be a few days, right? Mm. But they want to have access to that data as soon as possible. So we came up with a scheme, a distributed database scheme. So you have your local caches in the three offices. The task was, I've made some changes to the database, either to the, a listing that already exists, or I've entered a new listing, or I've deleted a listing. I've got a change log, essentially. So we needed to synchronize these three databases across these three offices every night, right? It's like, well, how are you going to do that? And again, there's no internet. <laughs> so, so what's the communication channel here? So what we did was we took the change log and we emailed it to each of the offices. So I've, I've got my change log, I mail it to you and you, and you do the same, right? So everyone now has everybody else's change log, and then we do a local resolution of the change log against the local database, right? Wow. So now all the three databases are in sync again. And we had to resolve things like, well, which changes first? You know, it's like time stamped and all this sort of stuff, and you had to have a universal clock and blah, blah, blah. So we did a distributed database based on email, <laughs> right? Wow. Now, we do this today, but we have more sophisticated real-time synchronization. Like we maybe you use Paxos as a protocol, or maybe you use um, uh, whatever. Let's just say Paxos. This was before all of that, <laughs> right? So we had to keep all these things in sync. And it's like, okay, so now we got that. The other part of it was complex forms. Because if you ever look at a house listing, there's like a hundred attributes. You got a checkbox and fill in the blank or whatever. And it's like, well, how are you going to do that? I mean, just keep in mind that at that time, the most extensive forms-based things was like, you know, your standard little window with 10 text fields, right? Not a form that has like a hundred checkboxes on it. That didn't exist, right? Mm. And so we created a, a way of doing that, and we had a real way of doing um, minimal refresh and redrawing and all that sort of stuff. And this is all in display PostScript, right? Mm. So it's very graphical and all this sort of stuff. So we had to create all the technology that went into like, well, how do you connect to the database? How do you store data in a local data set? How do you create these forms? So we created these pieces, you know, um, that we could then reuse, like Steven said before. So now when you need to do the next step, it's like, oh yeah, take your forms thing, take your database connection, take this thing, slam it together. Now I can create an app in you know, a couple of weeks instead of a couple of months, mm. right? Back then, this was super interesting, right? Mm. Nowadays, you say, oh yeah, just throw in some you know, React framework and you know, HTML, blah, 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 and you're done. It's like, yeah. Um, you still have to worry about the database, <laughs> you know. And then the, the, the last bit of technology uh, that we did there was uh, what eventually became Livewire. They needed to have a way where an agent's sitting at their desk, phone call comes in at the front office, the receptionist needs to be able to say, so-and-so is calling about this property. And you need to get a pop-up on your screen and you can reply, oh, uh, send the call through or hold it or whatever, right? Mm. So Livewire was exactly that, right? It's this mm. instant messaging thing that allows you to communicate with anyone. So we, you'd have your list of people that you could communicate with. You go, click, I'm talking to Harry, type in your message, 
Harry gets the message, it pops up on, you know, his little live wire thing. He can respond. You're now in an instant back and forth chat. You know, you can save the chat or you can delete it, whatever, but that's how it works, right? Uh, so all of that technology was birthed from that, that mm -hmm. one um, developing that, the Ares software, right? Mm -hmm. And again, what, this is 1990-ish. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was a long time ago, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, 30 years ago. Can you believe that, Stephen? This is yeah, it's, 30 it's years amazing. ago. <laughs> Feels like yesterday. Feels like yesterday. <laughs> and now we're catching up, finally. <laughs> the, there's, there's something else that's, uh, you know, one of the parts that I forgot to mention about this, uh, about the sale, the... Uh, <clears throat> We wanted Stephen Jobs wanted to didn't believe that Alain Pinel was viable because um, one of his executives' wife was a top agent over at Cornish and Carey, and of course they badmouthed uh, uh, Alain Pinel. Alain Pinel all the time. So Stephen Jobs already had this preconceived he already had this uh, preconceived notion that they weren't going to be a qualified buyer. So, but anyways, we, we were convinced, we convinced them to be able to take a meeting and it was, it was a nighttime meeting and it was a, a nighttime meeting it was uh, uh, Helen and uh, Helen Pastorino, the, the CEO, um, Mark Richards, who was actually working for us at the, uh, by that time, he decided to come over. I said, hey, you should work for us. And he, he ran, he ran sales, sales for us. And then uh, Paul Hume, who was the, the chairman and then Steve had his, his cadre of people, and it was a, a night meeting. He put us at night because I think he wanted to say, "Yeah, you guys aren't serious, right?" So, so Stephen Jobs, you know, we, we had the pizza box version of Next just came out, and so he gets up and he just he just just sells the lights out of this product. And he says why this is going to transform this and that, and he gives this whole vision thing, right? And if, if you were an Eskimo, he would have sold you ice that night, and. <laughs> So he, he gives a song and dance about the next of why it was such a great computer and was going to be the right thing for Alain Pinel. And, and the, the two things that were so distinct about that meeting was that he knew enough about Helen's business that he could speak at her level of why this machine was going to help her business. That, that, was, that was the best part of the sale. But, but the determining thing happened was that the, the determining factor of why Alain Pinel went with Next Computers was at the end of the night in the parking lot. And we were having our debrief. And because at the, at the end of Stephen's presentation, Paul Hume, the person who could write the check, said, I'm buying. It was just like, just like that. He goes, I'm in. And then in the parking lot, we we're kind of like having a debrief and then asked them, you know, I thought we we're gonna talk about this. Why did you make a decision so quick like that? He goes, Stephen, he goes, I don't know about anything of what that man just said in there. He goes, I have no idea of what he said is true. He goes, I don't even know what he was talking about. But I'll tell you one thing I do know, he's gonna deliver what, it's, what he said he was gonna deliver. So I believe him. I'm basically buying him, and, and the thing was, is he was not a, a Steve Jobs groupie. He, you know, he was a very strict, stern businessman. And he, what he was buying is like, I'm not buying those boxes. I don't care about those boxes. I'm buying that guy. And he didn't know about the Steve Jobs persona. He just knows I'm buying him. And if those boxes are what I'm buying to get my advantage in the marketplace, that's what I'm buying. And that, that goes to show you the the power of the individual right it was more steve he bought steve jobs more than he bought next computers and then it was up to us to be able to deliver the vision of what steve jobs said because it wasn't next that developed the apps we developed the apps or william developed the apps <laughs> our team developed so so that story is uh, of the sale i think is just as important as the applications that were built because it goes to show that Stephen Jobs' passion for his product is was more important than all the the bits and bytes of what was in the box itself. Yeah, I was curious. You mentioned you know this connection with Alan Pinnell started with Mark Richards. How did that happen? How did 
he introduced you to Ellen. He, he, um, he saw the next article, right? He saw okay. us in Next Step. Okay. Um, and before that, I think, when was the LA County Sheriff's before Alain Pinnell? I thought it was after. Well, there's also William Morris in there, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. So William Morris, maybe that one was the first one. And then LA County Sheriff's and then Alain Pinnell. Yeah, that's the right order. Hmm. That's the right order. Yeah, so, so see, all, all three of those, you know, like the LA County Sheriff's, which was tied to Rodney King and the yeah, that whole one got beat down. And, oh, my, oh, my God, that was terrible. That was on the verge, that was on the verge of closing. I know, and then, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We got to stop. We got, a, we got an issue. You, you're going to appreciate This is a great story. So you, we, uh, Booz Allen and Hamilton, when, you know, one of the big accounting firms or uh, consulting firms at the time, they had a contract with the LA County Sheriff's Department and they were going to be the prime contractor to to uh, upgrade and automate the LA County Sheriff's Department. So they had this contract. They've been working with us for months on it and we had cleared the decks. We're going to do this deal. We were, were we faxed it. We all three entities had to fax at the same time the agreement so it was gonna be like a million dollar agreement for us we were so excited so next signs sends in their faxes over their part of the agreement booze allen faxes theirs we fax ours and we're all waiting we're all waiting for the fax for the la county sheriffs to sign it and send it back so a fax came back it was a cancellation fax because the la county the la riots had just started that day with the whole rodney king beatdown so they canceled the contract and they referenced you know in the back of a contract they said this contract is canceled under hurricanes earthquake fires and riots and so you see that in the back of a of a of a, of a contract it's like yeah riots whatever they canceled the contract because of a riot. They they actually employed that clause, and it was it was a huge contract for Next. It would have been it would have changed the fortunes of Next, because it would have then validated them throughout the rest of the um, police force and uh, uh, throughout the country. But it got canceled because of the LA County riots, and um, and. Uh, we almost went out of business as a result because we had cleared the decks waiting for this application for this opportunity and it was like hundreds of computers uh for for next and we were going to build all the 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 software applications uh, f uh for them so that's a story that no one knows about because it didn't happen but that was one yeah, of that was going to yeah. be one of their biggest sales that they could have talked about because they couldn't talk about their military sales right. but they right. could talk about this one well, so that's interesting. Cause, so, because I think I read uh, about that in one of the later Next World magazines. So you're saying that it never actually went through. Correct. It never went through. Huh. Okay. Wow. I think it uh, got published before. I think that the the marketing engine of Mar of Next got ahead of the reality. Yeah. It was on the uh, way. It was. It was moments away. Yeah. It was moments away. Wow. The day so, that we're all so, signing, there was a riot. Say la vie. Yeah. So were you also involved in, in the William Morris sale yep. too? Yeah. Oh, yeah, wow. we were there. We were doing this. We were actually doing the software. We were actually flying down there. At the end of it, Next actually took over the software development. Uh, working with M William Morris is like, at the end of the day, they want, they want to be talking directly to Steve Jobs. You know, even though we already delivered, you know, all the software it's like ah we want him to be it's like okay but we were there you know they got that sale because they could see things like we used livewire or a precursor to livewire um we used our database technology we created a system for them that was tailor-made to their specifications mm. all of that uh was us doing the work and then eventually oh you, know, you got called over. remember we got called off the show floor right Remember we were at a we were at an expo or something like that. Oh yeah, that. yeah. And we were in um, we were at Moscone Center. Yeah, yeah. So no, we were no, at, we're in L.A. No, we're in New York. Yeah, Moscone Center. No, yeah, right. Uh, Javits. Javits Center. Javits. Right in New so York. we were actually in. I don't know if you want to hear the story or not, but we were in the Javits Center in New York, giving a demonstration. You know, I forget what the show was that we were at, but we were giving a demonstration of next stuff that we had done. 
and we got this call. It must have come from Next, huh? Next, they came to the booth. Yeah, so they, they say, oh, we got this thing. Can you fly on out, <laughs> you know? And we're like, uh, okay. And so we went back to our hotel room, and I think I was coding that night. Right. You coded that oh. night the demo. You coded right. the demo that so I, night. So I coded it. We go back to this is classic Silicon Valley shit, right? So we go back to the hotel room. <laughs> and keep in mind, this next computer is in a computer case that's the size of a steamador, right? And pulling that thing out, setting it up in the hotel room. I'm coding up some demo, whatever the demo was. And we're supposed to give this the next day. <laughs> Fly over to wherever we're going and give this demo and we wowed them enough they're like yeah okay let's do this so yeah we were there for to help land the sale to william morris talent agency wow wow damn fun yeah, times so, huh yeah so like, it's just so many of these sort of um like sales were dependent on this custom custom work that you guys did yeah in those and early none of days, the other companies yeah. did it yeah. Right. So like like the other companies like, you know, like uh, uh, all those other small companies, they were all application guys. Right. Mm. Since William was doing all this stuff with Ingress and had all this custom work, we that's why we were guys. able to do it. And we already had a library of tools from our package software to be able to go and repurpose them. Whereas all the other guys, none of them were enterprise guys. So that's why they kept coming to us. And the Booz Allens of the world, they didn't have a bench yet. So none of the consulting firms had a bench. And all the small developers, none of them had any enterprise experience other than William. That's why all those big customers came to us. Mm. And uh, because we're the only ones that had the expertise and the libraries to do the work. Mm. That's really interesting because it sounds like you guys almost were the pioneer for next pivot into this mission critical custom yep. enterprise app market. Well, that's where the naming came from. <laughs> Mission <laughs> critical custom applications. That was us. <laughs> so you were the first right. to do and, it. And, and the way, yes. and, and you know, and anyone, and you know, people would say, ah, oh, yeah, I was there, I was there, yeah. But we actually have the customer engagements to prove it, right? So it's not, you know, it's like William Morris, the LA County Sheriff's, Alon Pinnell. Those were all, all three of those were early you know, do or die situations for them, right? There were others after that. And but by the time the other ones had come, then other companies, other consulting firms were starting to get a bench. But before the bench was developed, you know, the first these were the first these were the the the, the hallmark companies. And then the package software never took off. But and the reason why we survived longer than all the other ISPs, I mean ISPs, um, and that's the business I'm in now. <laughs> the the uh, uh, software developers is because we had all this custom work that was off of our package software, right? And all the other ones died except for um, um, well, Lighthouse. Lighthouse. Yeah. 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 Right, right, right. Yeah. Huh. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, you also had this database from very early on. And later on, you know, Next developed their own DB kit, which then became Enterprise Objects Frameworks. But you guys already had this, you know, a similar functionality yep. right from the jump. Right. So they didn't have DB kit in the beginning. We created, uh, <clears throat> what was the, the actual objects were called like data manager and data set. And then the forms one was, I forget, the, the forms was, was probably called forms, <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, we had to do all that entity uh, management and database connectivity and blah, blah, blah. Uh, I don't know if any of that stuff that they came out with was patterned after what we did, but, you know, the pattern's pretty common and we had done it first, right? So yeah, that, that's just very useful. Yeah. Hmm. Um, did, did you participate in the Bay Area Next user group? Not really. I don't think so. Hmm. I don't know if we ever gave a presentation there or something, but we were busy writing code, not not doing the right. user yeah. group. 
No, we were we were before that. I think by the time that group kind of came up like a like a B mug type thing, we were we we're all kind of like, ah, we don't need that. We're already, you know, we're already talking to the sales guys. We're already, you know, we're already doing stuff, right? That community was kind of after the real stuff had happened. And then, you know, then then when the stuff started to implode, you know, you know, we we were you know, we were already able to get off because we saw it coming because we were on it for so long. Then we were on to BOS. <laughs> yeah. Well, intelligent first and then BOS. Yeah, intelligent. <laughs> but so there's another... Oh, yeah. oh, go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. Okay. You no, meant... go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, relative to this, I, I just want to you, it's not uh, linear, but it's, it's a story that I, I want to tell because it's, it, it's my favorite next story. Um, and or at least my my favorite next story uh, uh, that I was part of, <laughs> right? You know, um, it, it has to do with a, a dinner one night, um, and it, it's very similar to the Salon Pinel story from the from the standpoint of what really matters. But it was somebody else putting Steve Jobs in check as far as what's really important because sometimes he got you know. Uh, you know, he'd throw out lots of buzzwords, right? Yeah, interpersonal computing, whatever that meant. And, you know, there was all these, these things that, you know, his focus was always about the technology and always about the box. And that was limiting. And I think that's one of the reasons why Next really never took off, right? You know, and then there was a the whole IBM thing, right? You know, when they sold a license to IBM and they said, well, that was only for 1.0, you don't get the rest of the stuff and they screwed IBM and that was a big mistake. But there was, a, there was a night, there was that Stars restaurant in San Francisco. Stars is no longer there. I'm not sure if you remember it, but it was a, it was a high-end restaurant. It was actually the, uh, the, the owner of Stars, oh, I forgot the guy's name. He was actually a, a, a Will, uh, Alice Walker's uh, uh, part of that whole cabal. But anyway, Steve Jobs was a, you know, he, 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 was a, he liked that restaurant. So we had this customer night. And it was a very important night. And it was early in Next when they started migrating into custom, into you know, dealing with big enterprises. And so Next had this dinner, it had all their executive team, they had their strategic ISP, uh, uh, software, uh, uh, independent software developers, us, and some other ones. And then they had their customers, right? And so Stephen Jobs gets up at the dinner and he starts talking about how great the box is and blah, 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 blah. So then he sits down and Ross Perot is right, the first investor in, in Next. So Ross Perot gets up at the dinner and he's, and he's just really plain spoken man. And he just, he just gets up at the mic and he says, I just like to thank you, Steve, for bringing us all together tonight, blah, blah, blah. Then he says, and this was the, the best part, he says, I like all the customers in the room to stand up. And all the customers in the room stand up. And there was like a handful, right? There was, there was less than a dozen, right? And there was like, you probably, there was a hundred, if not more people in the room. So a handful of people stand up. And then, and then Ross Perot says, for all those that are sitting down, applaud those for standing up because that's why we're here tonight. <laughs> mm. And Stephen Jobs just had this blank look on his face because what Ross Perot did that I think this was the miss that Steve Jobs had with Next at the time was that Ross Perot broke it down to the customer is what matters. And Steve was, it's the technology that matters. And I think in the early days of the big lift, Next, as a company, missed that. And Ross Perot, I think, didn't invest further because of that, because we lost sight as a community that it was about the customer. It wasn't about the technology, right? So, um, so unlike, so it's the, it's the opposite side of the Paul Hume story about him buying because of Stephen Jobs and then Ross Perot saying it's about the customer. Don't forget about the customer. It's not about the technology. So anyways, I just, I like that story. So I told it. So it's done. So that's the other story that you wanted to tell. Why yeah, that's the other story. Yeah, okay. the, those the two, Perot because they, I, I tell both those stories because to me, where I am in business today, um, I, I, 
I hearken back to those stories of my own purpose in business, right? Um, it's like it's about the customer, not about the technology. It's a, technology is just a tool to whatever the customer wants to do. Stephen Jobs with Alain Pinel understood enough of the real estate because of Ron Weissman. That's the guy's name. Ron Weissman's wife worked at Cornish and Carey, and Ron Weissman and Steve were really close. And so Steve knew enough about Alain Pinel's business through Ron Weissman's wife. And that's why he was able to speak so uh, detailed about Alain Pinel's business because he knew about Cornish and Carey's business. So in that particular case, he was very intimately involved and had the knowledge of Alain Pinel's business because of his Ron Weissman's wife at Cornish and Carey. But when we're at Star's Restaurant, the global perspective of the customer, he kind of missed it. And then that's what Ron Ross Perot got up and to remind everybody, it's about the customer, not about the technology. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned that like Mark Richards was, you know, started to work for, for you guys. How, how big did the company grow? How many employees did you have? Was it six, I think, including us, eight? No, not that. How, is you, that right, William? Six? Me, Anita, Young, Mark, Bert was there or not at that time? Yeah, Bert was know. there. Uh, Paul, and, Paul and Scott were already gone, right? Yeah, they were transitioning. So it was, so it was eight. Six, 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 yeah, to, six eight. to eight. Yeah. So yeah, so no bigger than that. So it was how, how many people like on the technical side versus the business side? Oh, we're all technical except for Steven and, and Mark. Okay. All. <laughs> That's two out of four were not technical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> two thirds, two thirds, one third. Yeah. But you can so, see, you know, we're small, but. But we did a lot. And this was the, this yeah. is the beauty of the next platform is I, you know, you know, it's kind of, we're like a, a, a SEAL whoa, team, whoa, right? Whoa, whoa, you whoa, know. Hold on, hold on, my brother. <laughs> this is the beauty of my genius for programming. <laughs> oh, 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 it so oh, happened to be on the next platform. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Adams. I, I forgot. I forgot. <laughs> it I just shows how far a genius is like my brother. My genius brother with such superior tools could do so much work yes. with such little. With, is that, is with what? such meager resources. Oh, it we turned, resources. We turned our lemons not into just lemonade, but ambrosia. Oh, <laughs> yes. Oh, I forgot. I think you forget how good it was. No, I, I, I don't. I, I, I do know the genius that you guys were, but I do know that it's like a SEAL team, right? You know, it didn't matter if it was an application, it didn't matter if it, if it was a package application or if it was something that was a custom app. It didn't matter is that we had a, a, a team that worked very, very quickly because we had a really big tool set. And, and to William's credit also, you know, you know he, we had the right architectural frameworks to be able to be adaptive. You know, it's it's rare that you find an app, you don't see Adobe making custom apps and you don't see, um, you know, PricewaterhouseCoopers or Accenture making packaged apps, right? Those those worlds don't, 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 don't meet. Um, we did both because of the common infrastructure and the common architecture that we have developed that allowed us to go into both worlds, which allowed us to survive on the next. You know, we didn't get rich uh, on the next platform. Only a couple companies did, but we touched a lot and we influenced a lot. That was kind of our thing. Yeah. So William, like you, you developed like sort of shared frameworks that you would leverage, you know, between the package apps and the custom apps job to job? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of mentioned them before, but it's when you look at any app, even today, you know, you look at any app, it's like, well, there's only certain, there's patterns, right? So at that time, it was classic client server database apps. Okay, well, there's a data store you have to have a way to connect to that store in an abstract way so that you're not stuck down in, 
every single thing has to become a SQL query. It's like, ah, abstract that a little bit. Uh, we had to have another pattern was the data set, which is a local cache of stuff. So then you can do subsequent queries on that local cache instead of, again, hitting the database all the time. You have to have a way of getting stuff from the local data cache to your uh, presentation, right? So this is classic model view controller sort of stuff, if you're mm -hmm. familiar with those patterns. Yeah. Um, I knew Eric Gama back in the day. Oh, so, wow. But that was after all of this. I met okay. him at Taligent. So, you know, this is, this is uh, just recognizing the patterns, codifying the patterns, and then refining them after creating several apps, right? It's like, oh, okay, we created this app. Well, did we learn anything from that that makes that we can make this abstraction even more powerful so that the next time we had to create one of those, it's even less time, right? Mm. So we did that rapidly. And then one thing, one thing that really drove um, this architecture evolution was when you do custom work and you're a small company, you really quickly realize that you're, you're billing per hour, right? Mm -hmm. Any bugs you have to fix essentially discount the dollars you're taking in for new features, right? Mm. So if I get $100 and I had to spend half my time fixing bugs, I only got $50. Well, mm. I got to eat. <laughs> so by force, I better come up with frameworks that are less buggy, let me leverage more so that I don't spend half my time fixing bugs mm. and I get to spend more time billing for new features. Right, mm. so that's that's what helped shape those those frameworks. But yeah, there were there were frameworks in there, some of which I mentioned, which were just like at that time, um, we just didn't have, right? They didn't exist. Yeah. Um, now they do in spades. There's plenty of frameworks for all this kind of stuff, but at that time, none of that existed. Yeah, and I mean, how, you know, you 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 mentioned you know the how important like. Uh, next step in the app kit itself was you know compared to the tools that you you know were available on other platforms uh yes and no so at, at in the very earliest days the app kit was useful but it's like the like using visual tools today they only take mm. you so far right right when you're going to create a, a, a mls form that has 100 attributes check boxes on it that's not app kit mm. that's you and display postscript <laughs> mm, right, okay. you're not you're not using AppKit at that point. Yeah, uh, AppKit maybe you dragged and dropped the window, but you're on your own from there on, on out. Right. Uh, so we had to create essentially our own AppKit after that. So huh. now there's fundamentals that come from the programming environment, like we had this pattern speaker listener, right? Which was I don't know if you're familiar with that stuff, but it was a, a pattern for how you can communicate. Objective C had a, a thing where you can forward a method. If you don't recognize it, you can forward it on to somewhere. That was at the root of how you can communicate over the network in an abstract sort of way. So there's key aspects of the frameworks that they had that we used, but we didn't necessarily leverage the app kit itself for a lot of UI work. It's like, no, you kind of had to depart from that pretty quick. Right. Right. But it was a, it was the app kit was a leap of, ahead of anything that anyone else had at the time. That was I don't remember if that was before even Visual Basic was available on the Windows platform. Um, if it was, then it, it certainly wasn't as big as it is now. Yeah. Um, so app kit at the time was quite revolutionary, just being able to drag and drop and connect lines. And and sorry, I'll, I'll ramble on this for just one more second. Um, another key aspect of the, the way the uh, apps are done on ne Next Step was that Steve himself was a proponent of single click. So he's the one who personally, as an aesthetic, said you shouldn't have all these menus all over the place and features buried in menus. Everything should be one, maybe two clicks away. This was an aesthetic that he really pushed, and we took that to heart. And most of our apps, it's like, as much as possible, stuff is just right there and obvious, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than, and that's quite a departure from the way things were done at that time, because we were just coming out of the era of 
terminals with menu selections. Select one, now select three, now select, mm -hmm. you know, not even Windows where you're dragging around and clicking like on the Mac, but just, you know, your typical IT developed app was this, you know, green screen ASCII text, select one, select two, select three, right? And Steve comes along and says, no, it should all be one click, a drag, you know, it should feel good, it should be beautiful. So you get things like improv, the yeah. uh, spreadsheet, you know, and we did the same stuff. It's like to sort your column, just drag the thing to reshuffle them, drag that to the side to regroup them, click on this to resort, you know, uh, rather than going to a menu and saying, oh, now sort by blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's the kinds of stuff that AppKit and the platform in general gave us was just a different way of, of feeling about how the app should work rather than the clunky stuff we were doing before that point, right? Yeah. So, so it, I guess in a way, like it kind of raises the bar for user experience yeah. uh, across the whole platform. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because he was demanding, right? He was like, oh, your thing's a piece of shit. <laughs> you know, it, should, it shouldn't work like that. Why do I have to click three times for this thing, mm. you know? And, and you see it in things like what Glenn Reed did with, um, oh, what was this thing called? Um, well, whatever the Right Brain Software did. Uh, his publishing thing, now Glenn is, was, at that time, he was Mr. Postscript. I mean, he wrote the Green Book. <laughs> so, you know, he knew everything about Postscript and he created a beautiful, um, very usable publishing application. And it's like, yeah, like that right it's like it just looked good it felt good it maximized to the greatest extent what the platform was capable of doing right mm -hmm. and we all kind of aspired to that it's like look yeah. what glenn did oh yeah okay i'm not going to do clunky check boxes i'm going to do really awesome check boxes <laughs> right yeah so yeah that's that's the kind of thing that happened is that it sounds like you know the because it sounds like the you know, the whole community was was sort of expecting a certain kind of you know aesthetic because yeah I think like you know the some of the um, the reviews that you sent me um, were you know mildly critical of your of your UI in yeah. certain ways and yeah how did you... we had one of the earliest UIs out there mm -hmm. um, and we who was the artist that is it's an well, we had an artist that did our icons for us, but the, the style was kind of a Keith Haring style, right? At that time, we thought, ah, and keep in mind, this was one of the first apps available on the platform. Mm. So Luther, we were, Luther we were, Max. What's that? Luther? Yeah, Luther was our artist, and the style was kind of in the, the style of a Keith Haring. So the icons are kind of funky, you know, they're not this polished sort of 3D looking sort of thing. But we were out there, right? We are like, yeah. hey, man, this is the aesthetic we're going to try. Now, people come later and go, ah, it sucks. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, well, yours looks like everyone else's. <laughs> you know? So there was certainly criticism, you know, of our apps. And, and you could criticize other ones. And I learned from other people's apps. You know, we did Who's Calling First. Yeah. We did the Law and Pinnell stuff later. It was, what, it was much more functional, much more beautiful you know, didn't, didn't have that Keith Haring look to it. <laughs> Much more boring, right? But that's the way it is on the cutting edge. Some people are going to love it. Some people are going to see Andy Warhol and go, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, but it's also, important, it's also important to note that in those reviews, yeah, and, and, and it's like with everything else on Next, right? You know, the aesthetics is what matters most. But we didn't get knocked on the performance or the functionality. People, yeah. people were upset about <clears throat> the icons. You know, it's like it's garish looking. It's like, yeah, but but the shit works. <laughs> <laughs> Not just works; it does something nothing else does. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so. Um, I guess uh, we're we're coming towards the 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 hard stop today. Um, maybe. One, I guess one last question for today then, um, you know, you talked about earlier on, like you, you were completely self-funded. Did you, did you actually take any investment money later on? That came, that came in automation round two. 
Yeah. Right? Oh. That, that, that's, that's that came when, after. When, yeah. That came when we started to do stuff on the, the BOS and okay. beyond. Okay. Yeah. That was, and that's also the time when, um, you know, the realities of young family and wanting to keep pursuing the entrepreneurial dream, you know, where we diverted. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's a fun, that's, that's a fun time. I went to Microsoft, well, first to B, B first, and then to Microsoft, and Stephen uh, kept the automation flame going. Mm, okay, okay. Yeah. But, and then that's where I raised the, the, I raised money off of something. I raised money for off of some of the work that William had started, but then I brought a team, but I hired a team to finish the work William started. And that's when I raised a lot of money. And, and there's a lot of stuff in that story that we can talk about that's, that's indicative of what we did in, in, in Next. You know, being on the front, you know, seeing the future of what the future is gonna be and, uh, and being able to get other people, getting HP in particular, to write us a real big check <laughs> right, right. for that. But we can talk about uh, that, and uh, you know, the second go round. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. I think that, that that's a good, really good way to end because it sort of teases up for tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.